This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Chip in Tampa, Florida, on March the 29th, 2006. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part One. The history of England during the seventeenth century is the history of the transformation of a limited monarchy, constituted after the fashion of the Middle Ages, into a limited monarchy suited to that more advanced state of society, in which the public charges can no longer be borne by the estates of the crown, and in which the public defense can no longer be entrusted to a feudal militia. We have seen that the politicians who were at the head of the Long Parliament made, in 1642, a great effort to accomplish this change by transferring directly and formally to the estates of the realm the choice of ministers, the command of the army, and the superintendence of the whole executive administration. The scheme was perhaps the best that could then be contrived but it was completely disconcerted by the course which the Civil War took. The Houses triumphed, it is true, but not till after such a struggle as made it necessary for them to call into existence a power which they could not control, and which soon began to domineer over all orders and all parties. During a few years the evils inseparable from military government were, in some degree, mitigated by the wisdom and magnanimity of the great man who held the supreme command. But when the sword which he had wielded with energy indeed, but with energy always guided by good sense and generally tempered by good nature, had passed to captains who possessed neither his abilities nor his virtues, it seemed too probable that order and liberty would perish in one ignominious ruin. That ruin was happily averted. It had been too much the practice of writers zealous for freedom to represent the restoration as a disastrous event, and to condemn the folly or baseness of that convention which recalled the royal family without exacting new securities against maladministration. Those who hold this language do not comprehend the real nature of the crisis which followed the deposition of Richard Cromwell. England was in imminent danger of falling under the tyranny of a succession of small men raised up and pulled down by military caprice. To deliver the country from the domination of the soldiers was the first object of every enlightened patriot, but it was an object which, while the soldiers were united, the most sanguine could scarcely expect to obtain. On a sudden a gleam of hope appeared. General was opposed to general, army to army. On the use which might be made of one auspicious moment depended the future destiny of the nation. Our ancestors used that moment well. They forgot old injuries, waived petty scruples, adjourned to a more convenient season all dispute about the reforms which our institutions needed, and stood together, cavaliers and roundheads, Episcopalians and Presbyterians, in firm union for the old laws of the land against military despotism. The exact partition of power among king, lords, and commons might well be postponed, till it had been decided whether England should be governed by king, lords, and commons, or by curiosers and pikemen. Had the statesmen of the conventions taken a different course, had they held long debates on the principles of government, had they drawn up a new constitution and sent it to Charles, had the conferences been opened, had couriers been passing and repassing during some weeks between Westminster and the Netherlands, with projects and counter-projects, replies by Hyde and rejoinders by Prynne, the coalition on which the public safety depended would have been dissolved. The Presbyterians and Royalists would certainly have quarrelled. The military factions might possibly have been reconciled, 
and the misjudging friends of liberty might long have regretted, under a rule worse than that of the worst Stuart, the golden opportunity which had been suffered to escape. The old civil polity was therefore, by the general consent of both the great parties, re-established. It was again exactly what it had been when Charles the First, eighteen years before, withdrew from his capital. All those acts of the long Parliament, which had received the royal assent, were admitted to be still in full force. One fresh concession, a concession in which the Cavaliers were even more deeply interested than the Roundheads, was easily obtained from the restored King. The military tenure of land had been originally created as a means of natural defence. But in the course of ages, whatever was useful in the institution had disappeared, and nothing was left but ceremonies and grievances. A landed proprietor, who held an estate under the crown by night service, and it was thus that most of the soil of England was held, had to pay a large fine on coming to his property. He could not alienate one acre without purchasing a license. When he died, if his domains descended to an infant, the sovereign was guardian, and was not only entitled to great part of the rents during the minority, but could require the ward, under heavy penalties, to marry any person of suitable rank. The chief bait which attracted a needy sycophant to the court was the hope of obtaining, as the reward of servility and flattery, a royal letter to an heiress. These abuses had perished with the monarchy. That they should not revive with it was the wish of every landed gentleman in the kingdom. They were, therefore, solemnly abolished by statute, and no relic of the ancient tenures in chivalry was allowed to remain, except those honorary services which are still at a coronation rendered to the person of the sovereign by some lords of manners. The troops were now to be disbanded. Fifty thousand men, accustomed to the profession of arms, were at once thrown on the world, and experience seemed to warrant the belief that this change would produce such misery and crime that the discharged veterans would be seen begging in every street, or that they would be driven by hunger to pillage. But no such result followed. In a few months there remained not a trace indicating that the most formidable army in the world had just been absorbed into the mass of the community. The royalists themselves confessed that, in every department of honest industry, the discarded warriors prospered beyond other men, that none was charged with any theft or robbery, that none was heard to ask an alms, and that, if a baker, a mason, or a wagoner attracted notice by his diligence and sobriety, he was, in all probability, one of Oliver's old soldiers. The military tyranny had passed away, but it had left deep and enduring traces in the public mind. The name of Standing Army was long held in abhorrence, and it is remarkable that this feeling was even stronger among the Cavaliers than among the Roundheads. It ought to be considered as a most fortunate circumstance that, when our country was, for the first and last time, ruled by the sword, the sword was in the hands not of legitimate princes, but of those rebels who slew the king and demolished the church. Had a prince with a title as good as that of Charles commanded an army as good as that of Cromwell, there would have been little hope indeed for the liberties of England. Happily, that instrument by which alone the monarchy could be made absolute became an object of peculiar horror and disgust to the monarchical party and long continued to be inseparably associated in the imagination of royalists and prelatists with regicide and field-preaching. A century after the death of Cromwell, the Tories still continued to clamour against every augmentation of the regular soldiery, and to sound the praise of a national militia. So late as the year 1786, a minister who enjoyed no common measure of their confidence found it impossible to overcome their aversion to his scheme of fortifying the coast. 
nor did they ever look with entire complacency on the standing army, till the French Revolution gave a new direction to their apprehensions. The coalition which had restored the king terminated with the danger from which it had sprung, and two hostile parties again appeared ready for conflict. Both, indeed, were agreed as to the propriety of inflicting punishment on some unhappy men, who were, at that moment, objects of almost universal hatred. Cromwell was no more, and those who had fled before him were forced to content themselves with the miserable satisfaction of digging up, hanging, quartering, and burning the remains of the greatest prince that has ever ruled England. Other objects of vengeance, few indeed, yet too many, were found among the Republican chiefs. Soon, however, the conquerors, glutted with the blood of the regicides, turned against each other. The roundheads, while admitting the virtues of the late king, and while condemning the sentence passed upon him by an illegal tribunal, yet maintained that his administration had been, in many things, unconstitutional and that the houses had taken arms against him from good motives and on strong grounds. The monarchy, these politicians conceived, had no worse enemy than the flatterer, who exalted pejorative above the law, who condemned all opposition to regal encroachments, and who reviled not only Cromwell and Harrison, but Pym and Hampton as traitors. If the king wished for a quiet and prosperous reign, he must confide in those who, though they had drawn the sword in defence of the invaded privileges of Parliament, had yet exposed themselves to the rage of the soldiers in order to save his father, and had taken the chief part in bringing back the royal family. The feeling of the cavaliers was widely different. During eighteen years they had, through all vicissitudes, been faithful to the crown. Having shared the distress of their prince, were they not to share his triumph? Was no distinction to be made between them and the disloyal subject who had fought against his rightful sovereign, who had adhered to Richard Cromwell, and who had never concurred in the restoration of the Stuarts, still it appeared that nothing else might save the nation from the tyranny of the army? Grant that such a man had, by his recent services, fairly earned his pardon. Yet were his services rendered at the eleventh hour to be put in comparison with the toils and sufferings of those who had borne the burden and heat of the day? Was he to be ranked with men who had no need of the royal clemency, with men who had in every part of their lives merited the royal gratitude? Above all, was he to be suffered to retain a fortune raised out of the substance of the ruined defenders of the throne? Was it not enough that his head, and his patrimonial estate, a hundred times forfeited to justice, were secure, and that he shared with the rest of the nation in the blessings of that mild government of which he had too long been the foe? Was it necessary that he should be rewarded for his treason at the expense of men whose only crime was the fidelity with which they had observed their oath of allegiance? And what interest had the king in gorging his old enemies with prey torn from his old friends? What confidence could be placed in a man who had opposed their sovereign, made war on him, imprisoned him, and who even now, instead of hanging down their heads in shame and contrition, vindicated all that they had done, and seemed to think that they had given an illustrious proof of loyalty, by just stopping short of regicide. It was true that they had lately assisted to set up the throne, but it was not less true that they had previously pulled it down, and that they still avowed privileges which might impel them to pull it down again. Undoubtedly it might be fit that marks of royal approbation should be bestowed on some converts who had been eminently useful, but 
policy, as well as justice and gratitude, enjoined the king to give the highest place in his regard to those who, from first to last, through good and evil, had stood by his house. On these grounds the cavaliers very naturally demanded indemnity for all they had suffered, and preference in the distribution of the favors of the crown. Some violent members of the party went further, and clamored for large categories of proscription. The political feud was, as usual, exasperated by a religious feud. The king found the church in a singular state. A short time before the commencement of the Civil War, his father had given a reluctant assent to a bill strongly supported by Falkland, which deprived the bishops of their seats in the House of Lords. But episcopacy and the liturgy had never been abolished by law. The long Parliament, however, had passed ordinances which made a complete revolution in church government and in public worship. The new system was, in principle, scarcely less Erastian than that which it displaced. The houses, guided chiefly by the counsels of the accomplished Selden, had determined to keep the spiritual power strictly subordinate to the temporal power. They had refused to declare that any form of ecclesiastical polity was of divine origin, and they believed that, from all the church courts, an appeal should lie in the last resort to Parliament. With this highly important reservation, it had been resolved to set up in England a hierarchy closely resembling that which now exists in Scotland. The authority of councils, rising one above another in regular gradation, was substituted for the authority of bishops and archbishops. The liturgy gave place to the Presbyterian Directory, but scarcely had the new regulations been framed when the independence rose to supreme influence in the state. The independence had no disposition to enforce the ordinances touching classical, provincial, and national synods. These ordinances, therefore, were never carried into full execution. The Presbyterian system was fully established nowhere but in Middlesex and Lancashire. In the other fifty counties, almost every parish seems to have been unconnected with the neighboring parishes. In some districts, indeed, the ministers formed themselves into voluntary associations for the purpose of mutual help and counsel, but these associations had no coercive power. The patrons of livings, being now checked by neither bishop nor presbytery, would have been at liberty to confide the cure of souls to the most scandalous of mankind, but for the arbitrary intervention of Oliver. He established, by his own authority, a board of commissioners called Triers. Most of these persons were independent divines, but a few Presbyterian ministers and a few laymen had seats. The certificate of the Triers stood in the place both of institution and of induction, and without such a certificate no person could hold a benefice. That was undoubtedly one of the most despotic acts ever done by any English ruler. Yet, as it was generally felt that without some such precaution the country would be overrun by ignorant and drunken reprobates, bearing the name and receiving the pay of ministers, some highly respectable persons, who were not in general friendly to Cromwell, allowed that on this occasion he had been a public benefactor. The presentees whom the Triers had approved took possession of the rectories, cultivated the glebe lands, collected the tithens, prayed without book or surplice, and administered the Eucharist to communicants neatly seated at long tables. Thus the ecclesiastical polity of the realm was an inextricable confusion. Episcopacy was the form of government prescribed by the old law which was still unrepealed. The form of government prescribed by parliamentary ordinance was Presbyterian, but neither the old law nor the parliamentary ordinance was practically in force. 
the church actually established may be described as an irregular body made up of a few presbyteries and many independent congregations, which were all held down and held together by the authority of the government. Of those who had been active in bringing back the king, many were zealous for synods and for the directory, and many were desirous to terminate by a compromise the religious dissensions which had long agitated England. Between the bigoted followers of Laud and the bigoted followers of Knox, there could be neither peace nor truce, but it did not seem impossible to effect an accommodation between the moderate Episcopalians of the school of Usher and the moderate Presbyterians of the school of Baxter. The moderate Episcopalians would admit that a bishop might lawfully be assisted by a council. The moderate Presbyterians would not deny that each provincial assembly might lawfully have a permanent president, and that this president might lawfully be called a bishop. There might be a revised liturgy, which should not exclude extemporaneous prayer, a baptismal service in which the sign of the cross might be used or omitted at discretion, a communion service at which the faithful might sit if their conscience forbade them to kneel, but to no such plan could the great bodies of the cavaliers listen with patience. The religious members of that party were conscientiously attracted to the whole system of their church. She had been dear to their murdered king. She had consoled them in defeat and penury. Her service, so often whispered in an inner chamber during the season of trial, had such a charm for them that they were unwilling to part with a single response. Other royalists, who made little presence to piety, yet loved the Episcopal Church, because she was the foe of their foes. They valued a prayer or a ceremony not on account of the comfort which it conveyed to themselves, but on account of the vexation which it gave to the roundheads, and were so far from being disposed to purchase union by concession, that they objected to concession chiefly because it tended to produce union. Such feelings, though blamable, were natural and not wholly inexcusable. The Puritans had undoubtedly in the day of their power given cruel provocation. They ought to have learned, if from nothing else yet from their own discontents, from their own struggles, from their own victory, from the fall of that proud hierarchy by which they had been so heavily oppressed, that in England and in the seventeenth century it was not yet in the power of the civil magistrate to drill the minds of men into conformity with his own system of theology. They proved, however, as intolerant and as meddling as Laud had been. They interdicted under heavy penalties the use of the Book of Common Prayer, not only in churches, but even in private homes. It was a crime in a child to read by the bedside of a sick parent one of those beautiful collects which had soothed the griefs of forty generations of Christians. Severe punishments were denounced against such as would presume to blame the Calvinistic mode of worship. Clergymen of respectable character were not only ejected from their benefices by thousands, but were frequently exposed to the outrages of a fanatical rabble. Churches and sepulchres, fine works of art, and curious remains of antiquity were brutally defaced. The Parliament resolved that all pictures in the royal collection, which contained representations of Jesus or the Virgin Mother, should be burned. Sculpture fared as ill as painting, nymphs and graces, the work of Ionian chisels, were delivered over to Puritan stonemasons to be made decent. Against the lighter vices, the ruling faction waged war with a zeal little tempered by humanity or by common sense. 
sharp laws were passed against betting. It was enacted that adultery should be punished with death. The illicit intercourse of the sexes, even where neither violence nor seduction was imputed, where no public scandal was given, where no conjugal right was violated, was made a misdemeanor. Public amusements, from the masks which were exhibited at the mansions of the great, down to the wrestling matches and grinning matches on village greens, were vigorously attacked. One ordinance directed that all the maypoles in England should be forthwith hewn down. Another proscribed all theatrical diversions. The playhouses were to be dismantled. The spectators fined. The actors whipped at the cart's tail. Rope dancing, puppet shows, bowls, horse racing were regarded with no friendly eye. But bear baiting then the favorite diversion of high and low was the abomination which most strongly stirred the wrath of the austere sectaries. It is to be remarked that their antipathy to this sport had nothing in common with the feeling which has, in our own time, induced the legislature to interfere for the purpose of protecting beasts against the wanton cruelty of men. The Puritans hated bear-baiting, not because it gave pain to the bear, but because it gave pleasure to the spectators. Indeed, he generally contrived to enjoy the double pleasure of tormenting both spectators and bear. Perhaps no single circumstance more strongly illustrates the temper of the precisions than their conduct respecting Christmas Day. Christmas had been, from time immemorial, the season of joy and domestic affection, the season when families assembled, when children came home from school, where quarrels were made up, when carols were heard in every street, when every house was decorated with evergreens and every table loaded with good cheer. At that season all hearts not utterly destitute of kindness were enlarged and softened. At that season the poor were admitted to partake largely of the overflowings of the wealth of the rich, whose bounty was peculiarly acceptable on account of the shortness of the days and the severity of the weather. At that season the interval between landlord and tenant, master and servant, was less marked than through the rest of the year. Where there is much enjoyment, there will be some excess, yet, on the whole, the spirit in which the holiday was kept was not unworthy of a Christian festival. The long Parliament gave orders, in 1644, that the 25th of December should be held strictly observed as a fast, and that all men should pass it in humbly bemoaning the great national sin which they and their fathers had so often committed on that day, by romping under the mistletoe, eating boar's head, and drinking ale flavored with roasted apples. No public act of the time seems to have irritated the common people more. On the next anniversary of the festival, formidable riots broke out in many places. The constables were resisted, the magistrates insulted, the houses of noted zealots attacked, and the prescribed services of the day openly read in the churches. Such was the spirit of the extreme Puritans, both Presbyterian and Independent. Oliver, indeed, was little disposed to be either the persecutor or a meddler, but Oliver, the head of a party, and consequently to a great extent the slave of a party, could not govern altogether according to his own inclination. Even under his administration, many magistrates within their jurisdiction made themselves as odious as Sir Hudibras, interfered with all the pleasures of the neighborhood, dispersed festive meetings, and put fiddlers in the stocks. Still more formidable was the zeal of the soldiers. In every village where they appeared, there was an end of dancing, bell-ringing, and hockey. In London, 
They several times interrupted theatrical performances at which the protector had the judgment and good nature to connive. With the fear and hatred inspired by such a tyranny, contempt was largely mingled. The peculiarities of the Puritan, his look, his dress, his dialect, his strange scruples, had been, ever since the time of Elizabeth, favorite subjects with mockers. But these peculiarities appeared far more grotesque in a faction which ruled great empire than in an obscure and persecuted congregation. The cant, which had moved laughter when it was heard on the stage, from the tribulation wholesome, and zeal of the land busy, was still more laughable when it proceeded from the lips of generals and counsellors of state. It is also to be noticed that, during the civil troubles, several sects had sprung into existence, whose eccentricities surpassed anything that had been seen before in England. A mad tailor named Lodwick Muggleton wandered from pothouse to pothouse, tippling ale and denouncing eternal torments against those who refused to believe on his testimony that the supreme being was only six feet high, and that the sun was just four miles from the earth. George Fox had raised a tempest of derision by proclaiming that it was a violation of Christian sincerity to designate a single person by a plural pronoun, and that it was an idolatrous homage to Janus and Woden to talk about January and Wednesday. His doctrine, a few years later, was embraced by some eminent men, and rose greatly in the public estimation. But at the time of the Restoration, the Quakers were popularly regarded as the most despicable of fanatics. By the Puritans they were treated with severity here, and were persecuted to the death in New England. Nevertheless, the public, which seldom makes nice distinctions, often confounded the Puritan with the Quaker. Both were schismatics. Both hated episcopacy and the liturgy. Both had what seemed extravagant whimsies about dress, diversions, and postures. Widely as the two differed in opinion, they were popularly classed together as canting schismatics, and whatever was ridiculous or odious in either increased the scorn and aversion which the multitude felt for both. So ends Book One, Chapter Two, Part One. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Two. Before the Civil Wars, even those who most disliked the opinions and manners of the Puritan were forced to admit that his moral conduct was generally, in essentials, blameless. But this praise was now no longer bestowed, and, unfortunately, was no longer deserved. The general fate of sects is to obtain a high reputation for sanctity while they are oppressed and to lose it as soon as they become powerful. And the reason is obvious. It is seldom that a man enrolls himself in a prescribed body from any but conscientious motives. Such a body, therefore, is composed, with scarcely an exception, of sincere persons. The most rigid discipline that can be enforced within a religious society is a very feeble instrument of purification, when compared with a little sharp persecution from without. We may be certain that very few persons, not seriously impressed by religious convictions, applied for baptism, while Diocletian was vexing the church, or joined themselves to Protestant congregations at the risk of being burned by Bonner. But when a sect becomes powerful, when its favour is the road to riches and dignities, 
worldly and ambitious men, crowd into it, talk its language, conform strictly to its ritual, mimic its peculiarities, and frequently go beyond its honest members in all the outward indications of zeal. No discernment, no watchfulness on the part of ecclesiastical rulers, can prevent the intrusion of such false brethren. The tares and wheat must grow together. Soon the world begins to find out that the godly are not better than other men, and argues, with some justice, that if not better, they must be much worse. In no long time, all those signs which were formerly regarded as characteristic of a saint are regarded as characteristic of a knave. Thus it was with the English nonconformists. They had been oppressed, and oppression had kept them a pure body. They then became supreme in the state. No man could hope to rise to eminence and command, but by their favour. Their favour was to be gained only by exchanging with them the signs and passwords of spiritual fraternity. One of the first resolutions adopted by Barebone's Parliament, the most intensely puritanical of all our political assemblies, was that no person should be admitted into the public service till the House should be satisfied of his real godliness. What were then considered as the signs of real godliness? The sad-coloured dress, the sour look, the straight hair, the nasal whine, the speech interspersed with quaint texts, the Sunday gloomy as pharisaical Sabbath, were easily imitated by men to whom all religions were the same. The sincere Puritans soon found themselves lost in a multitude, not merely of men of the world, but of the very worst sort of men of the world, for the most notorious libertine who had fought under the royal standard might justly be thought virtuous when compared with some of those who, while they talked about sweet experiences and comfortable scriptures, lived in the constant practice of fraud, rapacity, and secret debauchery. The people, with a rashness which we may justly lament, but at which we cannot wonder, formed their estimate of the whole body from these hypocrites. The theology, the manners, the dialect of the Puritan, were thus associated in the public mind with the darkest and meanest vices. As soon as the Restoration had made it safe to avow enmity to the party which had so long been predominant, a general outcry against Puritanism arose from every corner of the kingdom, and was often swollen by the voices of those very dissemblers whose villainy had brought disgrace on the Puritan name. Thus the two great parties, which after a long contest had for a moment concurred in restoring monarchy, were both in politics and in religion again opposed to each other. The great body of the nation leaned to the royalists, the crimes of Strafford and Lord, the excesses of the Star Chamber, and of the High Commission, the great services which the long Parliament had during the first year of its existence rendered to the State, had faded from the minds of men. The execution of Charles I, the sullen tyranny of the rump, the violence of the army, were remembered with loathing, and the multitude was inclined to hold all who had withstood the late King responsible for his death and for the subsequent disasters. The House of Commons, having been elected while the Presbyterians were dominant, by no means represented the general sense of the people. Most of the members, while execrating Cromwell and Bradshaw, reverenced the memory of Essex and of Pym. One sturdy cavalier, who ventured to declare that all who had drawn the sword against Charles I were as much traitors as those who had cut off his head, was called to order, placed at the bar and reprimanded by the Speaker. The general wish of the House, undoubtedly, was to settle the last ecclesiastical disputes in a manner satisfactory to the moderate Puritans, but to such a settlement both the court and the nation were averse. The restored king was at this time more loved by the people than any of his predecessors had ever been. The calamities of his house, the heroic death of his father, his own long sufferings and romantic adventures, made him an object of tender interest. 
his return had delivered the country from an intolerable bondage. Recalled by the voice of both the contending factions, he was in a position which enabled him to arbitrate between them, and in some respects he was well qualified for the task. He had received from nature excellent parts and a happy temper. His education had been such as might have been expected to develop his understanding, and to form him to the practice of every public and private virtue. He had passed through all varieties of fortune, and had seen both sides of human nature. He had, while very young, been driven forth from a palace to a life of exile, penury, and danger. He had, at the age when mind and body are in their highest perfection, and when the first effervescence of boyish passions should have subsided, been recalled from his wanderings to wear a crown. He had been taught by bitter experience how much baseness, perfidy, and ingratitude may lie hid under the obsequious demeanour of courtiers. He had found, on the other hand, in the huts of the poorest, true nobility of soul. When wealth was offered to any who would betray him, when death was denounced against all who should shelter him, cottagers and serving men had kept his secret truly, and had kissed his hand under his mean disguises, with as much reverence as if he had been seated on his ancestral throne. From such a school it might have been expected that a young man who wanted neither abilities nor amiable qualities would have come forth a great and good king. Charles came forth from that school with social habits, with polite and engaging manners, and with some talent for lively conversation, addicted beyond measure to sensual indulgence, fond of sauntering, and of frivolous amusements, incapable of self-denial and of exertion, without faith in human virtue or in human attachment, without desire or renown, and without sensibility to reproach. According to him, every person was to be bought, but some people haggled more about their price than others. And when this haggling was very obstinate and very skilful, it was called by some fine name. The chief trick by which clever men kept up the price of their abilities was called integrity. The chief trick by which handsome women kept up the price of their beauty was called modesty. The love of God, the love of country, the love of family, the love of friends, were phrases of the same sort, delicate and convenient synonyms for the love of self. Thinking thus of mankind, Charles naturally cared very little what they thought of him. Honour and shame were scarcely more to him than light and darkness to the blind. His contempt of flattery has been highly commended, but seems when viewed in connection with the rest of his character, to deserve no commendation. It is possible to be below flattery as well as above it. One who trusts nobody will not trust sycophants. One who does not value real glory will not value its counterfeit. It is creditable to Charles's temper that, ill as he thought of his species, he never became a misanthrope. He saw little in men but what was hateful, Yet he did not hate them. Nay, he was so far humane, that it was highly disagreeable to him to see their sufferings, or to hear their complaints. This, however, is a sort of humanity which, though amiable and laudable in a private man, whose power to help or hurt is bounded by a narrow circle, has in princes often been rather a vice than a virtue. More than one well-disposed ruler has given up whole provinces to rapine and oppression, merely from a wish to see none but happy faces round his own board, and in his own walks. No man is fit to govern great societies, who hesitates about disobliging the few who have access to him, for the sake of the many whom he will never see. The facility of Charles was such as has perhaps never been found in any man of equal sense. He was a slave without being a dupe, worthless men and women, to the very bottom of whose hearts he saw, and whom he knew to be destitute of affection for him, and undeserving of his confidence, could easily wheedle him out of titles, places, domains, state secrets, and pardons. 
he bestowed much, yet he neither enjoyed the pleasure nor acquired the fame of beneficence. He never gave spontaneously, but it was painful to him to refuse. The consequence was that his bounty generally went not to those who deserved it best, nor even to those whom he liked best, but to the most shameless and importunate suitor who could obtain an audience. The motives which governed the political conduct of Charles the Second differed widely from those by which his predecessor and his successor were actuated. He was not a man to be imposed upon by the patriarchal theory of government and the doctrine of divine right. He was utterly without ambition. He detested business, and would sooner have abdicated his crown than have undergone the trouble of really directing the administration. Such was his aversion to toil, and such his ignorance of affairs, that the very clerks who attended him, when he sat in council, could not refrain from sneering at his frivolous remarks, and at his childish impatience. Neither gratitude nor revenge had any share in determining his course. For never was there a mind on which both services and injuries left such a faint and transitory impressions. He wished merely to be a king, such as Louis XV of France afterwards was, a king who could draw without limit on the treasury for the gratification of his private tastes, who could hire with wealth and honours persons capable of assisting him to kill the time, and who, even when the state was brought by maladministration to the depths of humiliation and to the brink of ruin, could still exclude and welcome truth from the purlieus of his own seraglio, and refused to see and hear whatever might disturb his luxurious repose. For these ends, and for these ends alone, he wished to obtain arbitrary power, if it could be attained without risk or trouble. In the religious disputes, which divided his Protestant subjects, his conscience was not at all interested, for his opinions oscillated in contented suspense between infidelity and popery. But, though his conscience was neutral in the quarrel between the Episcopalians and the Presbyterians, his taste was by no means so. His favourite vices were precisely those to which the Puritans were least indulgent. He could not get through one day without the help of diversions, which the Puritans regarded as sinful. As a man eminently well-bred and keenly sensible of the ridiculous, he was moved to contemptuous mirth by the Puritan oddities. He had, indeed, some reason to dislike the rigid sect. He had, at the age when the passions are most impetuous, and when levity is most pardonable, spent some months in Scotland, a king in name, but in fact a state prisoner in the hands of austere Presbyterians. Not content with requiring him to conform to their worship, and to subscribe their covenant, they had watched all his motions, and lectured him on all his youthful follies. He had been compelled to give reluctant attendance at endless prayers and sermons, and might think himself fortunate when he was not insolently reminded from the pulpit of his own frailties, of his father's tyranny, and of his mother's idolatry. Indeed, he had been so miserable during this part of his life, that the defeat which made him again a wanderer might be regarded as a deliverance rather than as a calamity. Under the influence of such feelings as these, Charles was desirous to depress the party which had resisted his father. The king's brother, James, Duke of York, took the same side. Though a libertine, James was diligent, methodical, and fond of authority and business. His understanding was singularly slow and narrow his temper obstinate, harsh, and unforgiving. That such a prince should have looked with no good will on the free institutions of England, and on the party which was peculiarly zealous for those institutions, can excite no surprise. As yet, the Duke professed himself a member of the Anglican Church, but he had already shown inclinations which had seriously alarmed good Protestants. The person on whom devolved at this time the greatest part of the labour of governing was Edward Hyde, Chancellor of the Realm, who 
who was soon created Earl of Clarendon. The respect which we justly feel for Clarendon as a writer must not blind us to the faults which he committed as a statesman. Some of these faults, however, are explained and excused by the unfortunate position in which he stood. He had, during the first year of the long Parliament, been honourably distinguished among the senators who laboured to redress the grievances of the nation. One of the most odious of those grievances, the Council of York, had been removed in consequence, chiefly of his exertions. When the Great Schism took place, when the Reforming Party and the Conservative Party first appeared marshalled against each other, he, with many wise and good men, took the Conservative side. He thenceforward followed the fortunes of the court, enjoyed as large a share of the confidence of Charles I as the reserved nature and tortuous policy of that prince allowed to any minister, and subsequently shared the exile and directed the political conduct of Charles the Second. At the Restoration, Hyde became chief minister. In a few months it was announced that he was closely related, by affinity, to the royal house. His daughter had become, by a secret marriage, Duchess of York. His grandchildren might, perhaps, wear the crown. He was raised by this illustrious connection over the heads of the old nobility of the land, and was for a time supposed to be all-powerful. In some respects he was well fitted for his great place. No man wrote abler state papers. No man spoke with more weight and dignity in council and in parliament. No man was better acquainted with general maxims of statecraft. No man observed the varieties of character with a more discriminating eye. It must be added that he had a strong sense of moral and religious obligation, a sincere reverence for the laws of his country, and a conscientious regard for the honour and interest of the crown. But his temper was sour, arrogant, and impatient of opposition. Above all, he had been long in exile, and this circumstance alone would have completely disqualified him for the supreme direction of affairs. It is scarcely possible that a politician who has been compelled by civil troubles to go into banishment, and to pass many of the best years of his life abroad, can be fit on the day which he returns to his native land, to be at the head of the government. Clarendon was no exception to this rule. He had left England with a mind heated by a fierce conflict, which had ended in the downfall of his party, and of his own fortunes. From 1646 to 1660, he had lived beyond sea, looking on all that passed at home from a great distance and through a false medium. His notions of public affairs were necessarily derived from the reports of plotters, many of whom were ruined and desperate men. Events naturally seemed to him auspicious, not in proportion as they increased the prosperity and glory of the nation, but in proportion as they tended to hasten the hour of his own return. His wish, a wish which he has not disguised, was that, till his countrymen brought back the old line, they might never enjoy quiet or freedom. At length he returned, and without having a single week to look about him, to mix with society, to note the changes which fourteen eventful years had produced in the national character and feelings, he was at once set to rule the state. In such circumstances, a minister of the greatest tact and docility, would probably have fallen into serious errors. But tact and docility made no part of the character of Clarendon. To him, England was still the England of his youth, and he sternly frowned down every theory and every practice which had sprung up during his own exile. Though he was far from meditating any attack on the ancient and undoubted power of the House of Commons, he saw with extreme uneasiness the growth of that power, the royal prerogative for which he had long suffered, and by which he had at length been raised to wealth and dignity, was sacred in his eyes. The roundheads he regarded both with political and with personal aversion. To the Anglican Church he had always been strongly attached, and had repeatedly, where her interests were concerned, separated himself with regret from his dearest friends. His zeal for episcopacy, and for the Book of Common Prayer, 
was now more ardent than ever, and was mingled with a vindictive hatred of the Puritans, which did him little honour, either as a statesman or as a Christian. While the House of Commons, which had recalled the royal family, was sitting, it was impossible to effect the re-establishment of the old ecclesiastical system. Not only were the intentions of the court strictly concealed, but assurances which quieted the minds of the moderate Presbyterians were given by the king in the most solemn manner. He had promised, before his restoration, that he would grant liberty of conscience to his subjects. He now repeated that promise, and added a promise to use his best endeavours for the purpose of effecting a compromise between the contending sects. He wished, he said, to see the spiritual jurisdiction divided between bishops and synods. The liturgy should be revised by a body of learned divines, one half of whom should be Presbyterians. The questions respecting the surplice, the posture at the Eucharist, and the sign of the cross in baptism should be settled in a way which would set tender consciences at ease. When the king had thus laid asleep the vigilance of those whom he most feared, he dissolved the Parliament. He had already given his assent to an act, by which an amnesty was granted, with few exceptions, to all who during the late troubles had been guilty of political offences. He had also obtained from the Commons a grant for life of taxes, the annual product of which was estimated at twelve hundred thousand pounds. The actual income, indeed during some years, mounted to little more than a million, but this sum, together with the hereditary revenue of the Crown, was then sufficient to defray the expenses of the government in time of peace. Nothing was allowed for a standing army. The nation was sick of the very name, and the least mention of such a force would have incensed and alarmed all parties. This audiobook is brought to you by Full Audiobooks. Please like, subscribe, and click the bell icon if you love audiobooks. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information and to find out how to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Kristen Luoma. GreenKRI.com the History of England From the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay Book One Chapter Two Part Three Early in sixteen sixty one took place a general election. The people were mad with loyal enthusiasm. The capital was excited by preparations for the most splendid coronation that had ever been known. The result was that a body of representatives was returned, such as England had never yet seen. A large proportion of the successful candidates were men who had fought for the crown and the church, and whose minds had been exasperated by many injuries and insults suffered at the hands of the roundheads. When the members met, the passions which animated each individually acquired new strength from sympathy. The House of Commons was, during some years, more zealous for royalty than the king, more zealous for episcopacy than the bishops. Charles and Clarendon were almost terrified at the completeness of their own success. They found themselves in a situation not unlike that in which Louis the Eighteenth and the Duke of Richelieu were placed while the chamber of 1815 was sitting. Even if the king had been desirous to fulfill the promises which he had made to the Presbyterians, it would have been out of his power to do so. It was indeed only by the strong exertion of his influence that he could prevent the victorious cavaliers from rescinding the act of indemnity, and retaliating without mercy all that they had suffered. The commons began resolving that every member should, on pain of expulsion, take the sacrament according to the form prescribed by the old liturgy, 
and that the covenant should be burned by the hangman in Palace Yard. An act was passed, which not only acknowledged the power of the sword to be solely in the king, but declared that in no extremity whatever could the two houses be justified in withstanding him by force. Another act was passed, which required every officer of a corporation to receive the Eucharist according to the rights of the Church of England, and to swear that he held resistance to the king's authority to be in all cases unlawful. A few hot-headed men wished to bring in a bill which should at once annul all the statutes passed by the Long Parliament, and should restore the Star Chamber and the High Commission. But the reaction, violent as it was, did not proceed quite to this length. It still continued to be the law that a Parliament should be held every three years. But the stringent clauses which directed the returning officers to proceed to election at the proper time, even without the royal writ, were repealed. The bishops were restored to their seats in the upper house. The old ecclesiastical polity and the old liturgy were revived without any modification which had any tendency to conciliate even the most reasonable Presbyterians. Episcopal ordination was now, for the first time, made an indispensable qualification for church preferment. About two thousand ministers of religion, whose conscience did not suffer them to conform, were driven from their benefices in one day. The dominant party exultingly reminded the sufferers that the long Parliament, when at the height of power, had turned out a still greater number of royalist divines. The reproach was but too well founded, but the long Parliament had at least allowed to the divines whom it ejected a provision sufficient to keep them from starving, and this example the cavaliers, intoxicated with animosity, had not the justice and humanity to follow. Then came penal statutes against nonconformists, statutes for which precedents might too easily be found in the Puritan legislation, but to which the king could not give his assent without a breach of promises publicly made, in the most important crisis of his life, to those on whom his fate depended. The Presbyterians, in extreme distress and terror, fled to the foot of the throne, and pleaded their recent services and the royal faith solemnly and repeatedly plighted. The king wavered. He could not deny his own hand and seal. He could not but be conscious that he owed much to the petitioners. He was little in the habit of resisting importunate solicitation. His temper was not that of a persecutor. He disliked the Puritans, indeed, but in him dislike was a languid feeling, very little resembling the energetic hatred which had burned in the heart of Loud. He was, moreover, partial to the Roman Catholic religion, and knew that it would be impossible to grant liberty of worship to the professors of that religion, without extending the same indulgence to Protestant dissenters. He therefore made a feeble attempt to restrain the intolerant zeal of the House of Commons, but that House was under the influence of far deeper convictions and far stronger passions than his own. After a faint struggle he yielded, and passed with the show of alacrity a series of odious acts against the separatists. It was made a crime to attend a dissenting place of worship. A single justice of the peace might convict without a jury, and might, for the third offence, pass sentence of transportation beyond sea for seven years. With refined cruelty it was provided that the offender should not be transported to New England, where he was likely to find sympathizing friends. If he returned to his own country before the expiration of his term of exile, he was liable to capital punishment. A new and most unreasonable test was imposed on divines who had been deprived of their benefices for nonconformity and all who refused to take that test were prohibited from coming within five miles of any town which was governed by a corporation, of any town which was represented in Parliament, or of any town where they had themselves resided as ministers. The magistrates, by whom these rigorous statutes were to be enforced, were in general men inflamed by party spirit, and by the remembrance of wrongs suffered in the time of the Commonwealth. The jails were therefore soon crowded with dissenters, 
and among the sufferers were some of whose genius and virtue any Christian society might well be proud. The Church of England was not ungrateful for the protection which she received from the government. From the first day of her existence she had been attached to monarchy, but, during the quarter of a century which followed the Restoration, her zeal for royal authority and hereditary right passed all bounds. She had suffered with the house of Stuart. She had been restored with that house. She was connected with it by common interests, friendships, and enmities. It seemed impossible that a day could ever come when the ties which bound her to the children of her august martyr would be sundered, and when the loyalty in which she gloried would cease to be a pleasing and profitable duty. She accordingly magnified in fulsome phrase that prerogative which was constantly employed to defend and to aggrandize her, and reprobated, much at her ease, the depravity of those whom oppression from which she was exempt had goaded to rebellion. Her favorite theme was the doctrine of non-resistance. That doctrine she taught without any qualification, and followed out to all its extreme consequences. Her disciples were never wary of repeating that in no conceivable case, not even if England were cursed with a king resembling Busiris or Phalaris, with a king who, in defiance of law, and without the presence of justice, should daily doom hundreds of innocent victims to torture and death, would all the estates of the realm united be justified in withstanding his tyranny by physical force. Happily the principles of human nature afford abundant security that such theories will never be more than theories. The day of trial came and the very men who had most loudly and most sincerely professed this extravagant loyalty were, in every county of England, arrayed in arms against the throne. Property all over the kingdom was now again changing hands. The national sales, not having been confirmed by act of Parliament, were regarded by the tribunals as nullities. The bishops, the deans, the chapters, the royalist nobility and gentry, re-entered on their confiscated estates, and ejected even purchasers who had given fair prices. The losses which the cavaliers had sustained during the ascendancy of their opponents were thus in part repaired, but in part only. All actions for mezzin profits were eventually barred by the general amnesty, and the numerous royalists who, in order to discharge fines imposed by the long parliament, or in order to purchase the favor of powerful roundheads, had sold lands for much less than the real value, were not relieved from the legal consequences of their own acts. While these changes were in progress, a change still more important took place in the morals and manners of the community. Those passions and tastes which, under the rule of the Puritans, had been sternly repressed, and, if gratified at all, had been gratified by stealth, broke forth with ungovernable violence as soon as the check was withdrawn. Men flew to frivolous amusements, and to criminal pleasures with the greediness which long and enforced abstinence naturally produces. Little restraint was imposed by public opinion, for the nation, nauseated with cant, suspicious of all pretensions to sanctity, and still smarting from the recent tyranny of rulers austere in life and powerful in prayer, looked for a time with complacency on the softer and gayer vices. Still less restraint was imposed by the government. Indeed, there was no excess which was not encouraged by the ostentatious profligacy of the king and of his favorite courtiers. A few councillors of Charles I, who were now no longer young, retained the decorous gravity which had been thirty years before in fashion at Whitehall. Such were Clarendon himself, and his friends, Thomas Riothesley, Earl of Southampton, Lord Treasurer, and James Butler, Duke of Ormond, who, having through many vicissitudes struggled gallantly for the royal cause in Ireland, now governed that kingdom as Lord Lieutenant. But neither the memory of the services of these men, nor their great power in the state, could protect them from the sarcasms which modish vice loves to dart at obsolete virtue. 
the praise of politeness and vivacity could now scarcely be obtained except by some violation of decorum. Talents great and various assisted to spread the contagion. Ethical philosophy had recently taken a form well suited to please a generation equally devoted to monarchy and to vice. Thomas Hobbes had, in language more precise and luminous than has ever been employed by any other metaphysical writer, maintained that the will of the prince was the standard of right and wrong, and that every subject ought to be ready to profess popery, Mahometanism, or paganism at the royal command. Thousands who were incompetent to appreciate what was really valuable in his speculations eagerly welcomed a theory which, while it exalted the kingly office, relaxed the obligations of morality, and degraded religion into a mere affair of state. Hobbism soon became an almost essential part of the character of the fine gentleman. All the lighter kinds of literature were deeply tainted by the prevailing licentiousness. Poetry stooped to be the pander of every low desire. Ridicule, instead of putting guilt and error to the blush, turned her formidable shafts against innocence and truth. The restored church contended indeed against the prevailing immorality, but contended feebly and with half a heart. It was necessary to the decorum of her character that she should admonish her erring children, but her admonitions were given in a somewhat perfunctory manner. Her attention was elsewhere engaged. Her whole soul was in the work of crushing the Puritans, and of teaching her disciples to give unto Caesar the things which were Caesar's. She had been pillaged and oppressed by the party which preached an austere morality. She had been restored to opulence and honor by libertines. Little as the men of mirth and fashion were disposed to shape their lives according to her precepts, they were yet ready to fight knee-deep in blood for her cathedrals and places, for every line of her rubric and every thread of her vestments. If the debauched cavalier haunted brothels and gambling-houses, he at least avoided conventicles. If he never spoke without uttering ribaldry and blasphemy, he made some amends by his eagerness to send Baxter and Howe to jail for preaching and praying. Thus the clergy for a time made war on schism with so much vigor that they had little leisure to make war on vice. The ribaldry of Etheridge and Wickerly was, in the presence and under the special sanction of the head of the church, publicly recited by female lips in female ears, while the author of the Pilgrim's Progress languished in a dungeon for the crime of proclaiming the gospel to the poor. It is an unquestionable and most instructive fact that the years during which the political power of the Anglican hierarchy was in the zenith were precisely the years during which the national virtue was at the lowest point. Scarcely any rank or profession escaped the infection of the prevailing immorality, but those persons who made politics their business were perhaps the most corrupt part of the corrupt society, for they were exposed not only to the same noxious influences which affected the nation generally, but also to a taint of a peculiar and of a most malignant kind. Their character had been formed amidst frequent and violent revolutions and counter-revolutions. In the course of a few years they had seen the ecclesiastical and civil polity of their country repeatedly changed. They had seen an Episcopal Church persecuting Puritans, a Puritan Church persecuting Episcopalians, and an Episcopal Church persecuting Puritans again. They had seen hereditary monarchy abolished and restored. They had seen the long Parliament thrice supreme in the state, and thrice dissolved amidst the curses and laughter of millions. They had seen a new dynasty rapidly rising to the height of power and glory, and then on a sudden hurled down from the chair of state without a struggle. They had seen a new representative system devised, tried, and abandoned. They had seen a new house of lords created and scattered. 
they had seen great masses of property violently transferred from cavaliers to roundheads, and from roundheads back to cavaliers. During these events no man could be a stirring and thriving politician who was not prepared to change with every change of fortune. It was only in retirement that any person could long keep the character either of a steady royalist or of a steady republican. One who, in such an age, is determined to attain civil greatness, must renounce all thoughts of consistency. Instead of affecting immutability in the midst of endless mutation, he must always be on the watch for the indications of a coming reaction. He must seize the exact moment for deserting a falling cause. Having gone all lengths with a faction while it was uppermost, he must suddenly extricate himself from it when its difficulties begin, must assail it, must persecute it, must enter on a new career of power and prosperity in company with new associates. His situation, naturally, develops in him to the highest degree a peculiar class of abilities and a peculiar class of vices. He becomes quick of observation and fertile of resource. He catches without effort the tone of any sect or party with which he chances to mingle. He discerns the signs of the times with a sagacity which to the multitude appears miraculous, with a sagacity resembling that with which a veteran police officer pursues the faintest indications of crime, or with which a Mohawk warrior follows a track through the woods. But we shall seldom find in a statesman so trained integrity, constancy, any of the virtues of the noble family of truth. He has no faith in any doctrine, no zeal for any cause. He has seen so many old institutions swept away that he has no reverence for prescription. He has seen so many new institutions, from which much had been expected, produce mere disappointment, that he has no hope of improvement. He sneers alike at those who are anxious to preserve and at those who are eager to reform. There is nothing in the state which he could not, without a scruple or a blush, join in defending or in destroying. Fidelity to opinions and to friends seems to him mere dullness and wrong-headedness. Politics he regards, not as a science of which the object is the happiness of mankind, but as an exciting game of mixed chance and skill at which a dexterous and lucky player may win an estate, a coronet, perhaps a crown, and at which one rash move may lead to the loss of fortune and of life. Ambition, which in good times and in good minds is half a virtue, now disjoined from every elevated and philanthropic sentiment, becomes a selfish cupidity scarcely less ignoble than avarice. Among these politicians, who from the restoration to the accession of the House of Hanover, were at the head of the great parties in the state, very few can be named whose reputation is not stained by what, in our age, would be called gross perfidy and corruption. It is scarcely an exaggeration to say that the most unprincipled public men who have taken part in affairs within our memory, would, if tried by the standard which was in fashion during the latter part of the seventeenth century, deserve to be regarded as scrupulous and disinterested. While these political, religious, and moral changes were taking place in England, the royal authority had been without difficulty re-established in every other part of the British islands. In Scotland the restoration of the Stuarts had been hailed with delight, for it was regarded as the restoration of national independence. And true it was that the yoke which Cromwell had imposed was, in appearance, taken away, that the Scottish estates again met in their old hall at Edinburgh, and that the senators of the College of Justice again administered the Scottish law according to the old forms. Yet was the independence of the little kingdom necessarily rather nominal than real. For as long as the king had England on his side, he had nothing to apprehend from disaffection in his other dominions. He was now in such a situation 
that he could renew the attempt which had proved destructive to his father without any danger of his father's fate. Charles I had tried to force his own religion by his regal power on the Scots at a moment when both his religion and his regal power were unpopular in England. And he had not only failed, but had raised troubles which had ultimately cost him his crown and his head. Times had now changed. England was zealous for monarchy and prelacy, and therefore the scheme which had formerly been in the highest degree imprudent might be resumed with little risk to the throne. The government resolved to set up a prelatical church in Scotland. The design was disapproved by every Scotchman whose judgment was entitled to respect. Some Scottish statesmen who were zealous for the king's prerogative had been bred Presbyterians. Though little troubled with scruples, they retained a preference for the religion of their childhood, and they well knew how strong a hold that religion had on the hearts of their countrymen. They remonstrated strongly, but, when they found that they remonstrated in vain, they had not virtue enough to persist in an opposition which would have given offence to their master. And several of them stooped to the wickedness and baseness of persecuting what in their consciences they believed to be the purest form of Christianity. The Scottish Parliament was so constituted that it had scarcely ever offered any serious opposition even to kings much weaker than Charles then was. Episcopy, therefore, was established by law. As to the form of worship, a large discretion was left to the clergy. In some churches the English liturgy was used. In others the ministers selected from that liturgy such prayers and thanksgivings as were likely to be least offensive to the people. But in general the doxology was sung at the close of public worship, and the Apostles' Creed was recited when baptism was administered. By the great body of the Scottish nation the new church was detested both as superstitious and as foreign. As tainted with the corruptions of Rome and as a mark of the predominance of England. There was, however, no general insurrection. The country was not what it had been twenty-two years before. Disastrous war and alien domination had tamed the spirit of the people. The aristocracy, which was held in great honor by the middle class and by the populace, had put itself at the head of the movement against Charles I, but proved obsequious to Charles the Second. From the English Puritans no aid was now to be expected. They were a feeble party, prescribed both by law and by public opinion. The bulk of the Scottish nation, therefore, sullenly submitted, and with many misgivings of conscience, attended the ministrations of the Episcopal clergy, or of the Presbyterian divines who had consented to accept from the government a half-toleration known by the name of indulgence. But there were, particularly in the western lowlands, many fierce and resolute men who held that the obligation to observe the covenant was paramount to the obligation to obey the magistrate. These people, in defiance of the law, persisted in meeting to worship God after their own fashion. The indulgence they regarded not as a partial reparation of the wrongs inflicted by the state on the church, but as a new wrong, the more odious because it was disguised under the appearance of a benefit. Persecution, they said, could only kill the body but the black indulgence was deadly to the soul. Driven from the towns they assembled on heaths and mountains. Attacked by civil power, they without scruple repelled force by force. At every conventicle they mustered in arms. They repeatedly broke out into open rebellion. They were easily defeated and mercilessly punished. But neither defeat nor punishment could subdue their spirit. Hunted down like wild beasts, tortured till their bones were beaten flat, imprisoned by hundreds, hanged by scores, exposed at one time to the license of soldiers from England, abandoned at another time to the mercy of troops of marauders from the highlands, they still stood at bay in a mood so savage 
that the boldest and mightiest oppressor could not but dread the audacity of their despair. Such was, during the reign of Charles the Second, the state of Scotland. Ireland was not less distracted. In that island existed feuds, compared with which the hottest animosities of English politicians were lukewarm. The enmity between the Irish cavaliers and the Irish roundheads was almost forgotten in the fiercer enmity which raged between the English and the Celtic races. The interval between the Episcopalian and the Presbyterian seemed to vanish, when compared with the interval which separated both from the Papist. During the late civil troubles the greater part of the Irish soil had been transferred from the vanquished nation to the victors. To the favour of the crown few either of the old or of the new occupants had any pretensions. The despoilers and the despoiled had, for the most part, been rebels alike. The government was soon perplexed and wearied by the conflicting claims and mutual accusations of the two incensed factions. Those colonists among whom Cromwell had portioned out the conquered territory, and whose descendants are still called Cromwellians, asserted that the aboriginal inhabitants were deadly enemies of the English nation under every dynasty, and of the Protestant religion in every form. They described and exaggerated the atrocities which had disgraced the insurrection of Ulster. They urged the king to follow up with resolution the policy of the protector, and they were not ashamed to hint that there would never be peace in Ireland till the old Irish race should be extirpated. The Roman Catholics extenuated their offence as they best might, and expatiated in piteous language on the severity of their punishment, which in turn had not been lenient. They implored Charles not to confound the innocent with the guilty, and they reminded him that many of the guilty had atoned for their fault by returning to their allegiance, and by defending his rights against the murderers of his father. The court, sick of the importunities of two parties, neither of which it had any reason to love, at length relieved itself from trouble by dictating a compromise. That system, cruel, but most complete and energetic, by which Oliver had proposed to make the island thoroughly English, was abandoned. The Cromwellians were induced to relinquish a third part of their acquisitions. The land thus surrendered was capriciously divided among claimants whom the government chose to favour, but great numbers who protested that they were innocent of all disloyalty, and some persons who boasted that their loyalty had been signally displayed, obtained neither restitution nor compensation, and filled France and Spain with outcries against the injustice and ingratitude of the House of Stuart. Meantime the government had, even in England, ceased to be popular. The royalists had begun to quarrel with the court and with each other, and the party which had been vanquished trampled down, and as it seemed annihilated, but which had still retained a strong principle of life, again raised its head and renewed the interminable war. End of chapter 2, part 3「This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recorded by Aaron Hockwimmer in Auckland, New Zealand. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two. Part 4. Had the administration been faultless, the enthusiasm with which the return of the king and the termination of the military tyranny had been hailed could not have been permanent. For it is the law of our nature that such fits of excitement shall always be followed by remissions. The manner in which the court abused its victory made the remission speedy and complete. Every moderate man was shocked by the insolence cruelty and perfidy with which the nonconformists were treated. The penal laws had effectually purged the oppressed party of those insincere members whose vices had disgraced it, 
and had made it again an honest and pious body of men. The Puritan, a conqueror, a ruler, a persecutor, a sequestrator, had been detested. The Puritan, betrayed and evil entreated, deserted by all the time servers who, in his prosperity, had claimed brotherhood with him, hunted from his home, forbidden under severe penalties to pray or receive the sacrament according to his conscience, yet still firm in his resolution to obey God rather than man, was, in spite of some unpleasing recollections, an object of pity and respect to well-constituted minds. These feelings became stronger when it was noised abroad that the court was not disposed to treat papists with the same rigour which had been shown to Presbyterians. A vague suspicion that the king and the duke were not sincere Protestants sprang up and gathered strength. Many persons to who had been disgusted by the austerity and hypocrisy of the saints of the commonwealth began to be still more disgusted by the open profligacy of the court and of the cavaliers, and were disposed to doubt whether the sullen preciseness of Praise God Barebone might not be preferable to the outrageous profaneness and licentiousness of the Buckinghams and Sedleys. Even immoral men, who were not utterly destitute of sense and public spirit, complained that the government treated the most serious matters as trifles, and made trifles its serious business. A king might be pardoned for amusing his leisure with wine, wit, and beauty, but it was intolerable that he should sink into a mere lounger and voluptuary, that the gravest affairs of state should be neglected, and that the public service should be starved and the finances deranged in order that harlots and parasites might grow rich. A large body of royalists joined in these complaints, and added many sharp reflections on the king's ingratitude. His whole revenue, indeed, would not have sufficed to reward them all in proportion to their unconsciousness of desert. For to every distressed gentleman who had fought under Rupert or Derby, his own services seemed eminently meritorious, and his own sufferings eminently severe. Every one had flattered himself that, whatever became of the rest, he should be largely recompensed for all that he had lost during the civil troubles, and that the restoration of the monarchy would be followed by the restoration of his own dilapidated fortunes. None of these expectants could restrain his indignation when he found that he was as poor under the king as he had been under the rump of the protector. The negligence and extravagance of the court excited the bitter indignation of these loyal veterans. They justly said that one half of what his majesty squandered on concubines and buffoons would gladden the hearts of hundreds of old cavaliers who, after cutting down their oaks and melting their plate to help his father, now wandered about in threadbare suits and did not know where to turn for a meal. At the same time a sudden fall of rents took place. The income of every landed proprietor was diminished by five shillings in the pound, the cry of agricultural distress rose from every shire in the kingdom, and for that distress the government was, as usual, held accountable. The gentry, compelled to retrench their expenses for a period, saw with indignation the increasing splendour and profusion of Whitehall, and were immovably fixed in the belief that the money which ought to have supported their households had, by some inexplicable process, gone to the favourites of the king. The minds of men were now in such a temper that every public act excited discontent. Charles had taken to wife Catherine, Princess of Portugal. The marriage was generally disliked, and the murmurs became loud when it appeared that the king was not likely to have any legitimate posterity. Dunkirk, won by Oliver from Spain, was sold to Louis the Fourteenth, King of France. This bargain excited general indignation. Englishmen were already beginning to observe with uneasiness the progress of the French power, and to regard the House of Bourbon with the same feeling with which their grandfathers had regarded the House of Austria. Was it wise, men asked, at such a time, to make any addition to the strength of a monarchy already too formidable? Dunkirk was, moreover, prized by the people, 
not merely as a place of arms and as a key to the Low Countries, but also as a trophy of English valour. It was to the subjects of Charles what Calais had been to an early generation, and what the Rock of Gibraltar, so manfully defended through disastrous and perilous years, against the fleets and armies of a mighty coalition, is to ourselves. The plea of economy might have had some weight, if it had been urged by an economical government, but it was notorious that the charges of Dunkirk fell far short of the sums which were wasted at court in vice and folly. It seemed insupportable that a sovereign, profuse beyond example in all that regarded his own pleasures, should be niggardly in all that regarded the safety and honour of the state. The public discontent was heightened when it was found that, while Dunkirk was abandoned on the plea of economy, the fortress of Tangier, which was part of the dower of Queen Catherine, was repaired and kept up at an enormous charge. That place was associated with no recollections gratifying to the national pride. It could in no way promote the national interests. It involved us in inglorious, unprofitable, and interminable wars with tribes of half-savage Mussulmans, and it was situated in a climate singularly unfavourable to the health and vigour of the English race. But the murmurs excited by these errors were faint, when compared with the clamours which soon broke forth. The government engaged in war with the United Provinces. The House of Commons readily voted sums unexampled in our history, sums exceeding those which had supported the fleets and armies of Cromwell at the time when his power was the terror of all the world. But such was the extravagance, dishonesty, and incapacity of those who had succeeded to his authority, that this liberality proved worse than useless. The psychopaths of the court, ill-qualified to contend against the great men who then directed the arms of Holland, against such statesmen as De Witt, and such a commander as de Ruyter, made fortunes rapidly, while the sailors mutinied from very hunger, while the dockyards were unguarded, while their ships were leaky and without rigging. It was at length determined to abandon all schemes of offensive war, and it soon appeared that even a defensive war was a task too hard for that administration. The Dutch fleet sailed up the Thames and burned the ships of war which lay at Chatham. It was said, on the very day of that great humiliation, the king feasted with the ladies of his seraglio, and amused himself with hunting a moth about the supper-room. Then at length tardy justice was done to the memory of Oliver. Everywhere men magnified his valour, genius, and patriotism. Everywhere it was remembered how, when he ruled, all foreign powers had trembled at the name of England how the States-General, now so haughty, had crouched at his feet, and how, when it was known that he was no more, Amsterdam was lighted up as for a great deliverance, and children ran along the canals, shouting for joy that the devil was dead. Even royalists exclaimed that the State could be saved only by calling the old soldiers of the Commonwealth to arms. Soon the capital began to feel the miseries of a blockade, Fuel was scarcely to be procured. Tilbury Fort, the place where Elizabeth had, with manly spirit, hurled foul scorn at Parma and Spain, was insulted by the invaders. The roar of foreign guns was heard for the first time by the citizens of London. In the council it was seriously proposed that, if the enemy advanced, the tower should be abandoned. Great multitudes of people assembled in the streets, crying out that England was bought and sold. The houses and carriages of the ministers were attacked by the populace, and it seemed likely that the government would have to deal at once with an invasion and with an insurrection. The extreme danger, it is true, soon passed by. A treaty was concluded, very different from the treaties which Oliver had been in the habit of signing, and the nation was once more at peace but it was in a mood scarcely less fierce and sullen than in the days of Shipmany. The discontent engendered by maladministration was heightened by calamities which the best administration could not have averted. While the ignominious war with Holland was raging, London suffered two great disasters, 
such as never, in so short a space of time, befell one city, a pestilence, surpassing in horror any that during three centuries had visited the island, swept away in six months, more than a hundred thousand human beings. And scarcely had the dead cart ceased to go its rounds, when a fire such as had not been known in Europe since the conflagration of Rome under Nero laid in ruins the whole city, from the tower to the temple, and from the river to the Perlius of Smithfield. Had there been a general election, while the nation was smarting under so many disgraces and misfortunes, it is probable that the roundheads would have regained ascendancy in the state. But the parliament was still a cavalier parliament, chosen in the transport of loyalty which had followed the restoration. Nevertheless, it soon became evident that no English legislature, however loyal, would now consent to be merely what the legislature had been under the Tudors. From the death of Elizabeth to the eve of the Civil War, the Puritans, who predominated in the representative body, had been constantly, by a dexterous use of the power of the purse, encroaching on the province of the executive government. The gentlemen who, after the Restoration, filled the lower house, though they abhorred the Puritan name, were well pleased to inherit the fruit of the Puritan policy. They were indeed most willing to employ the power which they possessed in the state for the purpose of making their king mighty and honoured, both at home and abroad. But with the power itself they resolved not to part. The great English revolution of the 17th century, that is to say, the transfer of the supreme control of the executive administration from the crown to the House of Commons was, through the whole long existence of this Parliament, proceeding noiselessly, but rapidly and steadily. Charles, kept poor by his follies and vices, wanted money. The Commons alone could legally grant him money. They could not be prevented from putting their own price on their grants. The price which they put on their grants was this, that they should be allowed to interfere with every one of the king's prerogatives, to wring from him his consent to laws which he disliked, to break up cabinets, to dictate the course of foreign policy, and even to direct the administration of war. To the royal office and the royal person they loudly and sincerely professed the strongest attachment. But to Clarendon they owed no allegiance, and they fell on him as furiously as their predecessors had fallen on Stratford. The minister's virtues and vices alike contributed to his ruin. He was the ostensible head of the administration, and was therefore held responsible even for those acts which he had strongly but vainly opposed in council. He was regarded by the Puritans, and by all who pitied them, as an implacable bigot, a second loud with much more than loud's understanding. He had on all occasions maintained that the act of indemnity ought to be strictly observed, and this part of his conduct, though highly honourable to him, made him hateful to all those royalists who wished to repair their ruined fortunes by suing the roundheads for damages and mesny profits. The Presbyterians of Scotland attributed to him the downfall of their church. The Papists of Ireland attributed to him the loss of their lands. As father of the Duchess of York, he had an obvious motive for wishing that there might be a barren queen, and he was therefore suspected of having purposefully recommended one. The sale of Dunkirk was justly imputed to him. For the war with Holland, he was, with less justice, held accountable. His hot temper, his arrogant deportment, the indelicate eagerness with which he grasped at riches, the ostentation with which he squandered them, his picture gallery, filled with masterpieces of Van Dyck, which had once been the property of ruined cavaliers, his palace, which reared its long and stately front right opposite to the humbler residence of our kings, drew on him much deserved, and some undeserved, censure. When the Dutch fleet was in the Thames, it was against the Chancellor that the rage of the populace was chiefly directed. His windows were broken, the trees of his garden were cut down, and a gibbet was set up before his door. But nowhere was he more detested than in the House of Commons. 
He was unable to perceive that the time was fast approaching when that house, if it continued to exist at all, must be supreme in the state, when the management of that house would be the most important department of politics, and when, without the help of the men possessing the air of that house, it would be impossible to carry on the government. He obstinately persisted in considering the Parliament as a body in no respect, differing from the Parliament which had been sitting when, forty years before, he first began to study law at the temple. He did not wish to deprive the legislature of those powers which were inherent in it by the old constitution of the realm, but the new development of those powers, though a development natural, inevitable, and to be prevented only by utterly destroying the powers themselves, disgusted and alarmed him. Nothing would have induced him to put the great seal to a writ for raising ship money, or to give his voice in council for committing a member of parliament to the tower, on account of words spoken in debate. But, when the commons began to inquire in what manner the money voted for the war had been wasted, and to examine into the maladministration of the navy, he flamed with indignation. Such inquiry, according to him, was out of their province. He admitted that the house was a most loyal assembly, that it had done good service to the crown, and that its intentions were excellent, but, both in public and in the closet, he, on every occasion, expressed his concern that gentlemen so sincerely attached to monarchy should unadvisedly encroach on the prerogative of the monarch. Widely as they differed in spirit from the members of the long parliament, they yet, he said, imitated that parliament in meddling with matters which lay beyond the sphere of the estates of the realm, and which were subject to the authority of the crown alone. The country, he maintained, would never be well governed till the knights of shires and the burgesses were content to be what their predecessors had been in the days of Elizabeth. All the plans which men more observant than himself, of the signs of that time proposed, for the purpose of maintaining a good understanding between the court and the commons, he disdainfully rejected as crude projects, inconsistent with the old polity of England. Towards the young orators, who were rising to distinction and authority in the lower house, his deportment was ungracious, and he succeeded in making them, with scarcely an exception, his deadly enemies. Indeed, one of his most serious faults was an inordinate contempt for youth, and this contempt was the more unjustifiable, because his own experience in English politics was by no means proportioned to his age. For so great a part of his life had been passed abroad that he knew less of the world in which he found himself on his return than many who might have been his sons. For these reasons he was disliked by the commons. For very different reasons he was equally disliked by the court. His morals, as well as his politics, were those of an earlier generation. Even when he was a young law student, living much with men of wit and pleasure, his natural gravity and his religious principles had to a great extent preserved him from the contagion of fashionable debauchery, and he was by no means likely, in advanced years and in declining health, to turn libertine. On the vices of the young and gay, he looked with an aversion almost as bitter and contemptuous as that which he felt for the theological errors of the sectaries. He missed no opportunity of showing his scorn of the mimics, revelers, and courtesans who crowded the palace and the admonitions which he addressed to the king himself were very sharp, and, what Charles disliked still more, very long. Scarcely any voice was raised in favour of a minister, loaded with the double odium of faults which roused the fury of the people, and of virtues which annoyed and importuned the sovereign. Southampton was no more. Ormond performed the duties of friendship manfully and faithfully, but in vain. The Chancellor fell with a great ruin. The seal was taken from him. The commons impeached him. His head was not safe. He fled from the country. An act was passed which doomed him to perpetual exile, and those who had assailed and undermined him began to struggle for the fragments of his power. The sacrifice of Clarendon, in some degree, took off the edge of the public appetite for revenge. 
Yet was the anger excited by the profusion and negligence of the government, and by the miscarriages of the late war, by no means extinguished. The councillors of Charles, with the fate of the Chancellor before their eyes, were anxious for their own safety. They accordingly advised their master to soothe the irritation which prevailed both in the Parliament and throughout the country, and for that end to take a step which has no parallel in the history of the House of Stuart, and which was worthy of the prudence and magnanimity of Oliver. End of This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Five. We have now reached a point at which the history of the great English Revolution begins to be complicated with the history of foreign politics. The power of Spain had, during many years, been declining. She still, it is true, held in Europe the Milanese and the two Sicilies, Belgium and Franche Comte. In America, her dominion still spread on both sides of the equator, far beyond the limits of the torrid zone. But this great body had been smitten with palsy, and was not only incapable of giving molestation to other states, but could not, without assistance, repel aggression. France was now, beyond all doubt, the greatest power in Europe. Her resources have, since those days, absolutely increased, but have not increased so fast as the resources of England. It must also be remembered that, a hundred and eighty years ago, the Empire of Russia, now a monarchy of the first class, was as entirely out of the system of European politics as Abyssinia or Siam, that the House of Brandenburg was then hardly more powerful than the House of Saxony, and that the Republic of the United States had not then begun to exist. The weight of France, therefore, though still very considerable, has relatively diminished. Her territory was not in the days of Louis the Fourteenth quite so extensive as at present. But it was large, compact, fertile, well placed both for attack and for defence, situated in a happy climate, and inhabited by a brave, active, and ingenious people. The state implicitly obeyed the direction of a single mind. The great fiefs, which three hundred years before had been, in all but name, independent principalities, had been annexed to the crown. Only a few old men could remember the last meeting of the states general. The resistance which the Huguenots, the nobles, and the parliaments had offered to the kingly power had been put down by the two great cardinals, who had ruled the nation during forty years. The government was now a despotism, but, at least in its dealings with the upper classes, a mild and generous despotism tempered by courteous manners and chivalrous sentiments. The means at the disposal of the sovereign were, for that age, truly formidable. His revenue, raised, it is true, by a severe and unequal taxation, which pressed heavily on the cultivators of the soil, far exceeded that of any other potentate. His army, excellently disciplined, and commanded by the greatest generals then living, already consisted of more than a hundred and twenty thousand men. Such an array of regular troops had not been seen in Europe since the downfall of the Roman Empire. Of maritime powers France was not the first, but though she had rivals on the sea, she had not yet a superior. Such was her strength during the last forty years of the seventeenth century that no enemy could singly withstand her, and that two great coalitions in which half Christendom was united against her failed of success. The personal qualities of the French king added to the respect inspired by the power and importance of his kingdom. No sovereign has ever represented the majesty of a great state with more dignity and grace. He was his own prime minister, and performed the duties of a prime minister with an ability and industry which could not be reasonably expected from one who had, in infancy, succeeded to a crown, and who had been surrounded by flatterers before he could speak. 
He had shown, in an eminent degree, two talents invaluable to a prince, the talent of choosing his servants well, and the talent of appropriating to himself the chief part of the credit of their acts. In his dealings with foreign powers he has some generosity, but no justice. To unhappy allies who threw themselves at his feet, and had no hope but in his compassion, he extended his protection with a romantic disinterestedness, which seemed better suited to a knight-errant than to a statement. But he broke through the most sacred ties of public faith, without scruple or shame, whenever they interfered with his interest, or with what he called his glory. His perfidy and violence, however, excited less enmity than the insolence with which he constantly reminded his neighbours of his own greatness, and of their littleness. He did not at this time profess the austere devotion which at a later period gave to his court the aspect of a monastery. On the contrary, he was as licentious, though by no means as frivolous and indolent, as his brother of England, but he was a sincere Roman Catholic, and both his conscience and his vanity impelled him to use his power for the defence and propagation of the true faith. After the example of his renowned predecessors, Clovis, Charlemagne, and St. Louis, our ancestors naturally look with serious alarm on the growing power of France. This feeling, in itself perfectly reasonable, was mingled with other feelings less praiseworthy. France was our old enemy. It was against France that the most glorious battles recorded in our annals had been fought. The conquest of France had been twice effected by the Plantagenets. The loss of France had been long remembered as a great national disaster. The title of King of France was still borne by our sovereigns. The lilies of France still appeared mingled with our own lions on the shield of the House of Stuart. In the sixteenth century, the dread inspired by Spain had suspended the animosity of which France had anciently been the object. But the dread inspired by Spain had given place to contemptuous compassion, and France was again regarded as our national foe. The sale of Dunkirk to France had been the most generally unpopular act of the restored king. Attachment to France had been prominent among the crimes imputed by the commons to Clarendon. Even in trifles the public feeling showed itself. When a brawl took place in the streets of Westminster between the retinues of the French and Spanish embassies, the populace, though forcibly prevented from interfering, had given unequivocal proofs that the old antipathy to France was not extinct. France and Spain were now engaged in a more serious contest. One of the chief objects of the policy of Louis throughout his life was to extend his dominions towards the Rhine. For this end he had engaged in war with Spain and he was now in the full career of conquest. The United Provinces saw with anxiety the progress of his arms. That renowned federation had reached the height of power, prosperity, and glory. The Batavian territory, conquered from the waves, and defended against them by human art, was in extent little superior to the Principality of Wales. But all that narrow space was a busy and populous hive, in which new wealth was every day created, and to which vast masses of old wealth were hoarded. The aspect of Holland, the rich cultivation, the innumerable canals, the ever-whirling mills, the endless fleets of barges, the quick succession of great towns, the ports bristling with thousands of masts, the large and stately mansions, the trim villas, the richly furnished apartments, the picture galleries, the summer rouses, the tulip beds, produced on English travellers in that age an effect similar to the effect which the first sight of England now produces on a Norwegian or a Canadian. The State General had been compelled to humble themselves before Cromwell, but after the Restoration they had taken their revenge, and had waged war with success against Charles, and had concluded peace on honourable terms. Rich, however, as the Republic was, and highly considered in Europe, she was no match for the power of Louis. She apprehended, not without good cause, that his kingdom might soon be extended to her frontiers. 
and she might well dread the immediate vicinity of a monarch so great, so ambitious, and so unscrupulous. Yet it was not easy to devise any expedient which might avert the danger. The Dutch alone could not turn the scale against France. On the side of the Rhine no help was to be expected. Several German princes had been gained by Louis, and the Emperor himself was embarrassed by the discontents of Hungary. England was separated from the United Provinces by the recollection of cruel injuries recently inflicted and endured, and a policy had, since the Restoration, been so devoid of wisdom and spirit that it was scarcely possible to expect from her any valuable assistance. But the fate of Clarendon, and the growing ill-humour of the Parliament, determined the advisers of Charles to adopt, on a sudden, a policy which amazed and delighted the nation. The English resident at Brussels, Sir William Temple, one of the most expert diplomatists and most pleasing writers of the age, had already represented to this court that it was both desirable and practicable to enter into engagements with the States-General for the purpose of checking the progress of France. For a time his suggestions had been slighted, but it was now thought expedient to act on them. He was commissioned to negotiate with the States-General. He proceeded to The Hague, and soon came to an understanding with John de Witt, then the chief minister of Holland. Sweden, small as her resources were, had, forty years before, been raised by the genius of Gustavus Adolphus to a high rank among European powers, and had not yet descended to her natural position. She was induced to join on this occasion with England and the States. Thus was formed that coalition known as the Triple Alliance. Louis showed signs of vexation and resentment, but did not think it politic to draw on himself the hostility of such a confederacy, in addition to that of Spain. He consented, therefore, to relinquish a large part of the territories which his armies had occupied. Peace was restored to Europe, and the English government, lately an object of general contempt, was, during a few months, regarded by foreign powers with respect, scarcely less than that which the protector had inspired. At home, the Triple Alliance was popular in the highest degree. It gratified alike national animosity and national pride. It put a limit to the encroachments of a powerful and ambitious neighbour. It bound the leading Protestant states together in a close union. Cavaliers and roundheads rejoiced in common. But the joy of the roundhead was even greater than that of the cavalier, for England had now allied herself strictly with a country republican in government and Presbyterian in religion, against a country ruled by an arbitrary prince and attached to the Roman Catholic Church. The House of Commons loudly applauded the treaty, and some uncourtly grumblers described it as the only good thing that had been done since the King came in. The King, however, cared little for the approbation of his Parliament, or of his people. The Triple Alliance he regarded merely as a temporary expedient for quieting discontents, which had seemed likely to become serious. The independence, the safety, the dignity of the nation, over which he presided, were nothing to him. He had begun to find constitutional restraints galling. Already had been formed in the Parliament a strong connection, known by the name of the Country Party. That party included all the public men who leaned towards Puritanism and Republicanism, and many who, though attached to the Church and to hereditary monarchy, had been driven into opposition by dread of popery, by dread of France, and by disgust at the extravagance, dissoluteness, and faithlessness of the court. The power of this band of politicians was constantly growing. Every year some of those members who had been returned to Parliament during the loyal excitement of 1661 had dropped off, and the vacant seats had generally been filled by persons less tractable. Charles did not think himself a king while an assembly of subjects could call for his account before paying his debts, and could insist on knowing which of his mistresses or boon companions had intercepted the money destined for the equipping and manning of the fleet. 
though not very studious of fame, he was galled by the taunts which were sometimes uttered in the discussions of the commons, and on one occasion attempted to restrain the freedom of speech by disgraceful means. Sir John Coventry, a country gentleman, had, in debate, sneered at the profligacy of the court. In any former reign he would probably have been called before the Privy Council and committed to the Tower. A different course was now taken. A gang of bullies was secretly sent to slit the nose of the offender. This ignoble revenge, instead of quelling the spirit of opposition, raised such a tempest that the King was compelled to submit to the cruel humiliation of passing an act which had tainted the instruments of his revenge, and which took from him the power of pardoning them. But, impatient as he was of constitutional restraints, how was he to emancipate himself from them? He could make himself despotic only by the help of a great standing army, and such an army was not in existence. His revenues did, indeed, enable him to keep up some regular troops. But those troops, though numerous enough to excite great jealousy and apprehension in the House of Commons and in the country, were scarcely numerous enough to protect Whitehall and the Tower against the rising of the mob of London. Such risings were indeed to be dreaded, for it was calculated that in the capital and its suburbs dwelt not less than twenty thousand of Oliver's old soldiers. Since the King was bent on emancipating himself from the control of Parliament, and since in such an enterprise he could not hope for effectual aid at home, it followed that he must look for aid abroad. The power and wealth of the King of France might be equal to the arduous task of establishing absolute monarchy in England. Such an ally would undoubtedly expect substantial proofs of gratitude for such a service. Charles must descend to the rank of a great vassal, and must make peace and war according to the directions of the government which protected him. His relation to Louis would closely resemble that in which the Raja of Nagpur and the King of Oud now stand to the British government. Those princes are bound to aid the East India Company in all hostilities, defensive and offensive, and to have no diplomatic relations, but such as the East India Company shall sanction. The Company, in turn, guarantees them against insurrection, as long as they faithfully discharge their obligation to the paramount power. They are permitted to dispose of large revenues, to fill their palaces with beautiful women, to besot themselves in the company of their favourite revellers, and to oppress with impunity any subject who may incur their displeasure. Such a life would be insupportable to a man of high spirit and of powerful understanding, but to Charles, sensual, indolent, unequal to any strong intellectual exertion, and destitute alike of all patriotism and of all sense of personal dignity, the prospect had nothing unpleasing. That the Duke of York should have concurred in the design of degrading that crown which was probable that he would himself one day wear, may seem more extraordinary, for his nature was haughty and imperious, and indeed he continued to the very last to show, by occasional starts and struggles, his impatience of the French yoke. But he was almost as much debased by superstition as his brother by indolence and vice. James was now a Roman Catholic. Religious bigotry had become the dominant sentiment of his narrow and stubborn mind, and had so mingled itself with his love of rule that the two passions could hardly be distinguished from each other. It seemed highly improbable that without foreign aid he would be able to attain ascendancy or even toleration for his own faith and he was in a temper to see nothing humiliating in any step which might promote the interest of the true church. A negotiation was opened, which lasted during several months. The chief agent between the English and French courts was the beautiful, graceful, and intelligent Henrietta, Duchess of Orléans, sister of Charles, sister-in-law of Louis, and a favourite with both. The King of England offered to declare himself a Roman Catholic, to dissolve the Triple Alliance, and to join with France against Holland, if France would engage to lend him such military and pecuniary aid as might make him independent of his Parliament. Louis at first affected to receive these propositions coolly, and at length agreed to them 
with the air of a man who is conferring a great favour. But, in truth, the course which he had resolved to take was one by which he might gain and could not lose. It seems certain that he never seriously thought of establishing despotism and popery in England by force of arms. He must have been aware that such an enterprise would be in the highest degree arduous and hazardous, that it would task to the utmost all the energies of France during many years, that it would be altogether incompatible with more promising schemes of aggrandizement which were dear to his heart. He would, indeed, willingly have acquired the merit and the glory of doing a great service on reasonable terms to the Church, of which he was a member. But he was little disposed to imitate his ancestors, who in the twelfth and thirteenth centuries had led the flower of French chivalry to die in Syria and Egypt, and he well knew that a crusade against Protestantism in Great Britain would not be less perilous than the expeditions in which the armies of Louis the Seventh and of Louis the Ninth had perished. He had no motive for wishing the Stuarts to be absolute. He did not regard the English constitution with feelings at all resembling those which have in later times induced princes to make war on the free institutions of neighbouring nations. At present, a great party zealous for popular government has ramifications in every civilised country. An important advantage gained anywhere by that party is almost certain to be the signal for general commotion. It is not wonderful that governments threatened by a common danger should combine for the purpose of mutual insurance, but in the seventeenth century no such danger existed. Between the public mind of England and the public mind of France there was a great gulf. Our institutions and our factions were as little understood at Paris as at Constantinople. It may be doubted whether any one of the forty members of the French Academy had an English volume in his library, or knew Shakespeare, Johnson, or Spencer, even by name. A few Huguenots, who had inherited the mutinous spirit of their ancestors, might perhaps have a fellow feeling with their brethren, in the faith the English roundheads. But the Huguenots had ceased to be formidable. The French, as a people, attached to the Church of Rome, and proud of the greatness of their king, and of their own loyalty, looked on our struggles against popery and arbitrary power, not only without admiration or sympathy, but with strong disapprobation and disgust. It would therefore be a great error to ascribe the conduct of Louis to apprehensions at all resembling those which, in our age, induced the Holy Alliance to interfere in the internal troubles of Naples and Spain. Nevertheless, the propositions made by the court of Whitehall were most welcome to him. He already meditated gigantic designs which were destined to keep Europe in constant fermentation during more than forty years. He wished to humble the United Provinces and to annex Belgium, French Comte and Lorraine to his dominions. Nor was this all. The King of Spain was a sickly child. It was likely he would die without issue. His eldest sister was Queen of France. A day would almost certainly come, and might come very soon, when the House of Bourbon might lay claim to that vast empire on which the sun never set. The union of the two great monarchies under one head would doubtless be opposed by a continental coalition. But for any continental coalition, France single-handed was a match. England could turn the scale on the course which, in such a crisis, England might pursue. The destinies of the world would depend, and it was notorious that the English Parliament and nation were strongly attached to the policy which had dictated the Triple Alliance. Nothing, therefore, could be more gratifying to Louis than to learn that the princes of the House of Stuart needed his help, and were willing to purchase that help by unbounded subserviency. He determined to profit by the opportunity, and laid down for himself a plan to which, without deviation, he adhered to the revolution of 1688, disconcerted all his politics. He professed himself desirous to promote the designs of the English court. He promised large aid. He from time to time 
doled out such aid as might serve to keep hope alive, and as he could without risk or inconvenience spare. In this way, at an expense very much less than that which he occurred in building and decorating Versailles, or Marley, he succeeded in making England, during nearly twenty years, almost as insignificant a member of the political system of Europe as the Republic of San Marino. His object was not to destroy our Constitution, but to keep the various elements of which it was composed in a perpetual state of conflict, and to set irreconcilable enmity between those who had the power of the purse and those who had the power of the sword. With this view he bribed and stimulated both parties in turn, pensioned at once the ministers of the crown and the chiefs of the opposition, encouraged the court to withstand the seditious encroachments of the parliament, and conveyed to the parliament intimations of the arbitrary designs of the court. One of the devices to which he resorted for the purposes of obtaining an ascendancy in the English councils deserves a special notice. Charles, though incapable of love in the highest sense of the word, was the slave of any woman whose person excited his desires, and whose airs and prattle amused his leisure. Indeed, a husband would be justly derided who should bear from a wife of exalted rank and spotless virtue half the insolence which the King of England bore from concubines, who, while they owed everything to his bounty, caressed his courtiers almost before his face. He had patiently endured the termagant passions of Barbara Palmer and the pert vivacity of Eleanor Gwynne. Louis thought that the most useful envoy who could be sent to London would be a handsome, licentious, and crafty Frenchwoman. Such a woman was Louisa, a lady of the house of Caraville, whom our rude ancestors called Madame Carwell. She was soon triumphant over all her rivals, was created Duchess of Portsmouth, was loaded with wealth, and obtained a dominion which ended only with the life of Charles. The most important conditions of the alliance between the crowns were digested into a secret treaty which was signed at Dover in May 1670, just ten years after the day on which Charles had landed at that very port, amidst the acclamations and joyful tears of a too confiding people. By this treaty, Charles bound himself to make public profession of the Roman Catholic religion, to join his arms to those of Louis for the purposes of destroying the power of the United Provinces, and to employ the whole strength of England by land and sea in support of the rights of the House of Bourbon to the vast monarchy of Spain. Louis, on the other hand, engaged to pay a large subsidy, and promised that, if any insurrection should break out in England, he would send an army at his own charge to support his ally. This compact was made with gloomy auspices. Six weeks after it had been signed and sealed, the charming princess, whose influence over her brother and brother-in-law had been so pernicious to her country, was no more. Her death gave rise to horrible suspicions, which for a moment seemed likely to interrupt the newly formed friendship between the houses of Stuart and Bourbon. But in a short time, fresh assurances of undiminished goodwill were exchanged between the confederates. The Duke of York, too dull to apprehend danger, or too fanatical to care about it, was impatient to see the article touching the Roman Catholic religion carried into immediate execution. But Louis had the wisdom to perceive that, if this course were taken, there would be such an explosion in England as would probably frustrate those parts of the plan which he had most at heart. It was therefore determined that Charles should still call himself a Protestant, and should still at high festivals receive the sacrament according to the ritual of the Church of England. His more scrupulous brother ceased to appear in the royal chapel. About this time died the Duchess of York, daughter of the banished Earl of Clarendon. She had been, during some years, a concealed Roman Catholic. She left two daughters, Mary and Anne, afterwards successively queens of Great Britain. They were bred Protestants by the positive command of the king, who knew that it would be vain for him to profess himself a member of the Church of England, if children who seemed likely to inherit his throne were, by his permission, brought up as members of the Church of Rome. 
The principal servants of the crown at this time were men whose names have justly acquired an unenviable notoriety. We must take heed, however, that we do not load their memory with infamy, which of right belongs to their master. For the Treaty of Dover, the king himself is chiefly answerable. He held conferences on it with the French agents. He wrote many letters concerning it with his own hand. He was the person who first suggested the most disgraceful articles which it contained, and he carefully concealed some of those articles from the majority of his cabinet. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This reading by Kara Schallenberg, www.kray.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second, by Thomas Babington Macaulay, Book One, Chapter Two, Part Six. Few things in our history are more curious than the origin and growth of the power now possessed by the cabinet. From an early period the kings of England had been assisted by a privy council, to which the law assigned many important functions and duties. During several centuries this body deliberated on the gravest and most delicate affairs. But by degrees its character changed. It became too large for despatch and secrecy. The rank of privy councillor was often bestowed as an honorary distinction on persons to whom nothing was confided, and whose opinion was never asked. The sovereign, on the most important occasions, resorted for advice to a small knot of leading ministers. The advantages and disadvantages of this course were early pointed out by Bacon, with his usual judgment and sagacity, but it was not till after the Restoration that the interior council began to attract general notice. During many years old-fashioned politicians continued to regard the cabinet as an unconstitutional and dangerous board. Nevertheless, it constantly became more and more important. It at length drew to itself the chief executive power, and has now been regarded, during several generations, as an essential part of our polity. Yet, strange to say, it still continues to be altogether unknown to the law. The names of the noblemen and gentlemen who compose it are never officially announced to the public. No record is kept of its meetings and resolutions, nor has its existence ever been recognized by any act of Parliament. During some years the word cabal was popularly used as synonymous with cabinet. But it happened by a whimsical coincidence that, in 1671, the cabinet consisted of five persons, the initial letters of whose names made up the word cabal. Clifford, Arlington, Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale. These ministers were therefore emphatically called the Cabal, and they soon made that appellation so infamous that it has never since their time been used except as a term of reproach. Sir Thomas Clifford was a commissioner of the Treasury, and had greatly distinguished himself in the House of Commons. Of the members of the Cabal he was the most respectable, for, with a fiery and imperious temper, he had a strong, though a lamentably perverted, sense of duty and honour. Henry Bennet, Lord Arlington, then Secretary of State, had since come to manhood, resided principally on the Continent, and had learned that cosmopolitan indifference to constitutions and religions which is often observable in persons whose life has been passed in vagrant diplomacy. If there was any form of government which he liked, it was that of France. If there was any church for which he felt a preference, it was that of Rome. He had some talent for conversation, and some talent also for transacting the ordinary business of office. He had learned, during a life passed in travelling and negotiating, the art of accommodating his language and deportment to the society in which he found himself. His vivacity in the closet amused the king. His gravity in debates and conferences imposed on the public. And he had succeeded in attaching to himself 
partly by services and partly by hopes, a considerable number of personal retainers. Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale were men in whom the immorality which was epidemic among the politicians of that age appeared in its most malignant type, but variously modified by great diversities of temper and understanding. Buckingham was a sated man of pleasure, who had turned to ambition as to a pastime. As he had tried to amuse himself with architecture and music, with writing farces and with seeking for the philosopher's stone, so he now tried to amuse himself with a secret negotiation and a Dutch war. He had already, rather from fickleness and love of novelty than from any deep design, been faithless to every party. At one time he had ranked among the cavaliers. At another time warrants had been out against him for maintaining a treasonable correspondence with the remains of the Republican party in the city. He was now again a courtier, and was eager to win the favour of the king by services from which the most illustrious of those who had fought and suffered for the royal house would have recoiled with horror. Ashley, with a far stronger head, and with a far fiercer and more earnest ambition, had been equally versatile. But Ashley's versatility was the effect not of levity, but of deliberate selfishness. He had served, and betrayed, a succession of governments. But he had timed all his treacheries so well, that through all revolutions his fortunes had constantly been rising. The multitude, struck with admiration by a prosperity which, while everything else was constantly changing, remained unchangeable, attributed to him a prescience almost miraculous, and likened him to the Hebrew statesman of whom it is written that his counsel was as if a man had inquired of the oracle of God. Lauderdale, loud and coarse both in mirth and anger, was, perhaps, under the outward show of boisterous frankness, the most dishonest man in the whole cabal. He had made himself conspicuous among the Scotch insurgents of 1638 by his zeal for the covenant. He was accused of having been deeply concerned in the sale of Charles I to the English Parliament, and was therefore, in the estimation of good cavaliers, a traitor, if possible, of a worse description than those who had sate in the high court of justice. He often talked with a noisy jocularity of the days when he was a cantor and a rebel. He was now the chief instrument employed by the court in the work of forcing episcopacy on his reluctant countrymen, nor did he in that cause shrink from the unsparing use of the sword, the halter, and the boot. Yet those who knew him knew that thirty years had made no change in his real sentiments, that he still hated the memory of Charles I, and that he still preferred the Presbyterian form of church government to every other. Unscrupulous as Buckingham, Ashley, and Lauderdale were, it was not thought safe to entrust to them the king's intention of declaring himself a Roman Catholic. A false treaty, in which the article concerning religion was omitted, was shown to them. The names and seals of Clifford and Arlington are affixed to the genuine treaty. Both these statesmen had a partiality for the old church, a partiality which the brave and vehement Clifford in no long time manfully avowed, but which the colder and meaner Arlington concealed, till the near approach of death scared him into sincerity. The three other cabinet ministers, however, were not men to be kept easily in the dark, and probably suspected more than was distinctly avowed to them. They were certainly privy to all the political engagements contracted with France, and were not ashamed to receive large gratifications from Lewis. The first object of Charles was to obtain from the commons supplies which might be employed in executing the secret treaty. The cabal, holding power at a time when our government was in a state of transition, united in itself two different kinds of vices belonging to two different ages and to two different systems. 
as those five evil counsellors were among the last English statesmen who seriously thought of destroying the Parliament, so they were the first English statesmen who attempted extensively to corrupt it. We find in their policy at once the latest trace of the thorough of Strafford, and the earliest trace of that methodical bribery which was afterwards practised by Walpole. They soon perceived, however, that, though the House of Commons was chiefly composed of cavaliers, and though places and French gold had been lavished on the members, there was no chance that even the least odious parts of the scheme arranged at Dover would be supported by a majority. It was necessary to have recourse to fraud. The King professed great zeal for the principles of the Triple Alliance, and pretended that, in order to hold the ambition of France in check, it would be necessary to augment the fleet. The Commons fell into the snare, and voted a grant of eight hundred thousand pounds. The Parliament was instantly prorogued, and the Court, thus emancipated from control, proceeded to the execution of the great design. The financial difficulties, however, were serious. A war with Holland could be carried on only at enormous cost. The ordinary revenue was not more than sufficient to support the government in time of peace. The eight hundred thousand pounds out of which the commons had just been tricked would not defray the naval and military charge of a single year of hostilities. After the terrible lesson given by the long Parliament, even the cabal did not venture to recommend benevolences or ship-money. In this perplexity Ashley and Clifford proposed a flagitious breach of public faith. The goldsmiths of London were then not only dealers in the precious metals, but also bankers, and were in the habit of advancing large sums of money to the government. In return for these advances they received assignments on the revenue, and were repaid with interest as the taxes came in. About thirteen hundred thousand pounds had been in this way entrusted to the honour of the state. On a sudden it was announced that it was not convenient to pay the principal, and that the lenders must content themselves with interest. They were consequently unable to meet their own engagements. The exchange was in an uproar, several great mercantile houses broke, and dismay and distress spread through all society. Meanwhile, rapid strides were made towards despotism. Proclamations dispensing with acts of Parliament, or enjoining what only Parliament could lawfully enjoin, appeared in rapid succession. Of these edicts the most important was the Declaration of Indulgence. By this instrument the penal laws against Roman Catholics were set aside. And, that the real object of the measure might not be perceived, the laws against Protestant nonconformists were also suspended. A few days after the appearance of the Declaration of Indulgence, war was proclaimed against the United Provinces. By sea the Dutch maintained the struggle with honour, but on land they were at first borne down by irresistible force. A great French army passed the Rhine. Fortress after fortress opened its gates. Three of the seven provinces of the Federation were occupied by the invaders. The fires of the hostile camp were seen from the top of the Stadthaus of Amsterdam. The Republic, thus fiercely assailed from without, was torn at the same time by internal dissensions. The government was in the hands of a close oligarchy of powerful burghers. There were numerous self-elected town councils, each of which exercised within its own sphere many of the rights of sovereignty. These councils sent delegates to the provincial states, and the provincial states again sent delegates to the states-general. A hereditary first magistrate was no essential part of this polity. Nevertheless, one family, singularly fertile of great men, had gradually obtained a large and somewhat indefinite authority. William, first of the name, Prince of Orange-Nassau, and Stadtholder of Holland, had headed the memorable insurrection against Spain. 
His son, Maurice, had been captain-general, and first minister of the States, had, by eminent abilities and public services, and by some treacherous and cruel actions, raised himself to almost kingly power, and had bequeathed a great part of that power to his family. The influence of the stadtholders was an object of extreme jealousy to the municipal oligarchy. But the army, and that great body of citizens which was excluded from all share in the government, looked on the burgomasters and deputies with a dislike resembling the dislike with which the legions and the common people of Rome regarded the senate, and were as zealous for the house of Orange as the legions and the common people of Rome for the house of Caesar. The stadtholder commanded the forces of the commonwealth, disposed of all military commands, had a large share of the civil patronage, and was surrounded by pomp almost regal. Prince William the Second had been strongly opposed by the oligarchical party. His life had terminated in the year 1650, amidst great civil troubles. He died childless. The adherents of his house were left for a short time without a head, and the powers which he had exercised were divided among the town councils, the provincial states, and the states-general. But a few days after William's death, his widow, Mary, daughter of Charles I, King of Great Britain, gave birth to a son, destined to raise the glory and authority of the House of Nassau to the highest point, to save the United Provinces from slavery, to curb the power of France, and to establish the English Constitution on a lasting foundation. The prince, named William Henry, was from his birth an object of serious apprehension to the party now supreme in Holland, and of loyal attachment to the old friends of his line. He enjoyed high consideration as the possessor of a splendid fortune, as the chief of one of the most illustrious houses in Europe, as a magnet of the German Empire, as a prince of the blood royal of England, and, above all, as the descendant of the founders of Batavian liberty. But the high office which had once been considered as hereditary in his family remained in abeyance, and the intention of the aristocratical party was that there should never be another stadtholder. The want of a first magistrate was, to a great extent, supplied by the grand pensionary of the province of Holland, John de Witt, whose abilities, firmness, and integrity had raised him to unrivalled authority in the councils of the municipal oligarchy. The French invasion produced a complete change. The suffering and terrified people raged fiercely against the government. In their madness they attacked the bravest captains and the ablest statesmen of the distressed commonwealth. De Reuter was insulted by the rabble. De Witt was torn in pieces before the gate of the palace of the States-General at the Hog. The Prince of Orange, who had no share in the guilt of the murder, but who, on this occasion, as on another lamentable occasion twenty years later, extended to crimes perpetrated in his cause an indulgence which has left a stain on his glory, became chief of the government without a rival. Young as he was, his ardent and unconquerable spirit, though disguised by a cold and sullen manner, soon roused the courage of his dismayed countrymen. It was in vain that both his uncle and the French king attempted by splendid offers to seduce him from the cause of the Republic. To the States-General he spoke a high and inspiriting language. He even ventured to suggest a scheme which has an aspect of antique heroism, and which, if it had been accomplished, would have been the noblest subject for epic song that is to be found in the whole compass of modern history. He told the deputies that, even if their natal soil, and the marvels with which human industry had covered it, were buried under the ocean, all was not lost. The Hollanders might survive Holland. Liberty and pure religion, driven by tyrants and bigots from Europe, might take refuge in the farthest isles of Asia. The shipping in the ports of the Republic would suffice to carry two hundred thousand emigrants to the Indian archipelago. 
there the dutch commonwealth might commence a new and more glorious existence and might rear under the southern cross amidst the sugar-canes and nutmeg trees the exchange of a wealthier amsterdam and the schools of a more learned leyden the national spirit swelled and rose high the terms offered by the allies were firmly rejected the dikes were opened the whole country was turned into one great lake from which the cities with their ramparts and steeples rose like islands the invaders were forced to save themselves from destruction by a precipitate retreat lewis who though he sometimes thought it necessary to appear at the head of his troops greatly preferred a palace to a camp had already returned to enjoy the adulation of poets and the smiles of ladies in the newly planted alleys of versailles and now the tide turned fast the event of the maritime war had been doubtful by land the united provinces had obtained a respite and a respite though short was of infinite importance alarmed by the vast designs of lewis both the branches of the great house of austria sprang to arms spain and holland divided by the memory of ancient wrongs and humiliations were reconciled by the nearness of the common danger from every part of germany troops poured towards the rhine the english government had already expended all the funds which had been obtained by pillaging the public creditor no loan could be expected from the city an attempt to raise taxes by the royal authority would have at once produced a rebellion and lewis who had now to maintain a contest against half europe was in no condition to furnish the means of coercing the people of england it was necessary to convoke the parliament in the spring of sixteen seventy three therefore the houses reassembled after a recess of nearly two years clifford now a peer and lord treasurer and ashley now earl of shaftesbury and lord chancellor were the persons on whom the king principally relied as parliamentary managers the country party instantly began to attack the policy of the cabal the attack was made not in the way of storm but by slow and scientific approaches the commons at first held out hopes that they would give support to the king's foreign policy but insisted that he should purchase that support by abandoning his whole system of domestic policy their chief object was to obtain the revocation of the declaration of indulgence of all the many unpopular steps taken by the government the most unpopular was the publishing of this declaration the most opposite sentiments had been shocked by an act so liberal done in a manner so despotic all the enemies of religious freedom and all the friends of civil freedom found themselves on the same side and these two classes made up nineteen twentieths of the nation the zealous churchmen exclaimed against the favour which had been shown both to the papist and to the puritan the puritan though he might rejoice in the suspension of the persecution by which he had been harassed felt little gratitude for a toleration which he was to share with antichrist and all englishmen who valued liberty and law saw with uneasiness the deep inroad which the prerogative had made into the province of the legislature it must in candour be admitted that the constitutional question was then not quite free from obscurity our ancient kings had undoubtedly claimed and exercised the right of suspending the operation of penal laws the tribunals had recognized that right parliaments had suffered it to pass unchallenged that some such right was inherent in the crown few even of the country party ventured in the face of precedent and authority to deny yet it was clear that if this prerogative were without limit the english government could scarcely be distinguished from a pure despotism that there was a limit was fully admitted by the king and his ministers whether the declaration of indulgence lay within or without the limit was the question and neither party could succeed in tracing any line which would bear examination some opponents of the government complained that the declaration suspended not less than forty statutes 
but why not forty as well as one? There was an orator who gave it as his opinion that the king might constitutionally dispense with bad laws, but not with good laws. The absurdity of such a distinction it is needless to expose. The doctrine which seems to have been generally received in the House of Commons was, that the dispensing power was confined to secular matters, and did not extend to laws enacted for the security of the established religion. Yet, as the king was supreme head of the church, it should seem that, if he possessed the dispensing power at all, he might well possess that power where the church was concerned. When the courtiers on the other side attempted to point out the bounds of this prerogative, they were not more successful than the opposition had been. The truth is that the dispensing power was a great anomaly in politics. It was utterly inconsistent in theory with the principles of mixed government, but it had grown up in times when people troubled themselves little about theories. It had not been very grossly abused in practice. It had therefore been tolerated, and had gradually acquired a kind of prescription. At length it was employed, after a long interval, in an enlightened age, and at an important conjecture, to an extent never before known, and for a purpose generally abhorred. It was instantly subjected to a severe scrutiny. Men did not, indeed, at first venture to pronounce it altogether unconstitutional, but they began to perceive that it was at direct variance with the spirit of the Constitution, and would, if left unchecked, turn the English government from a limited into an absolute monarchy. Under the influence of such apprehensions, the commons denied the king's right to dispense, not indeed with all penal statutes, but with penal statutes in matters ecclesiastical, and gave him plainly to understand that, unless he renounced that right, they would grant no supply for the Dutch war. He, for a moment, showed some inclination to put everything to hazard, but he was strongly advised by Lewis to submit to necessity, and to wait for better times, when the French armies, now employed in an arduous struggle on the continent, might be available for the purpose of suppressing discontent in England. In the cabal itself the signs of disunion and treachery began to appear. Shaftesbury, with his proverbial sagacity, saw that a violent reaction was at hand, and that all things were tending towards a crisis resembling that of 1640. He was determined that such a crisis should not find him in the situation of Strafford. He therefore turned suddenly round, and acknowledged, in the House of Lords, that the declaration was illegal. The King, thus deserted by his ally and by his Chancellor, yielded, cancelled the declaration, and solemnly promised that it should never be drawn into precedent. Even this concession was insufficient. The Commons, not content with having forced their sovereign to annul the indulgence, next extorted his unwilling assent to a celebrated law, which continued in force down to the reign of George the Fourth. This law, known as the Test Act, provided that all persons holding any office, civil or military, should take the oath of supremacy, should subscribe a declaration against transubstantiation, and should publicly receive the sacrament according to the rites of the Church of England. The preamble expressed hostility only to the Papists. But the enacting clauses were scarcely more unfavourable to the Papists than to the rigid Puritans. The Puritans, however, terrified at the evident leaning of the court towards popery, and encouraged by some churchmen to hope that, as soon as the Roman Catholics should have been effectually disarmed, relief would be extended to Protestant nonconformists, made little opposition. Nor could the king, who was in extreme want of money, venture to withhold his sanction. The act was passed, and the Duke of York was consequently under the necessity of resigning the great place of Lord High Admiral. Hitherto the Commons had not declared against the Dutch war, but when the King had, in return for money cautiously doled out, relinquished his whole plan of domestic policy, 
they fell impetuously on his foreign policy. They requested him to dismiss Buckingham and Lauderdale from his councils for ever, and appointed a committee to consider the propriety of impeaching Arlington. In a short time the cabal was no more. Clifford, who alone of the five had any claim to be regarded as an honest man, refused to take the new test, laid down his white staff, and retired to his country seat. Arlington quitted the post of Secretary of State for a quiet and dignified employment in the royal household. Shaftesbury and Buckingham made their peace with the opposition, and appeared at the head of the stormy democracy of the city. Lauderdale, however, still continued to be minister for Scotch affairs, with which the English Parliament could not interfere. And now the Commons urged the King to make peace with Holland, and expressly declared that no more supplies should be granted for the war, unless it should appear that the enemy obstinately refused to consent to reasonable terms. Charles found it necessary to postpone to a more convenient season all thought of executing the Treaty of Dover, and to cajole the nation by pretending to return to the policy of the Triple Alliance. Temple, who, during the ascendancy of the Cabal, had lived in seclusion among his books and flower-beds, was called forth from his hermitage. By his instrumentality a separate peace was concluded with the United Provinces, and he again became ambassador at the Hague, where his presence was regarded as a sure pledge for the sincerity of his court. End of Part 6 Read by Kara Schallenberg on April 11, 2006 in Oceanside, California. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two. Part seven. The chief direction of affairs was now entrusted to Sir Thomas Osborne, a Yorkshire baronet who had in the House of Commons shown eminent talents for business and debate. Osborne became Lord Treasurer, and was soon created Earl of Danby. He was not a man whose character, if tried by any high standard of morality, would appear to merit approbation. He was greedy of wealth and honours, corrupt himself, and a corrupter of others. The cabal had bequeathed to him the art of bribing parliaments, an art still rude and giving little promise of the rare perfection to which it was brought in the following century. He improved greatly on the plan of the first inventors. They had merely purchased orators, but every man who had a vote might sell himself to Danby. Yet the new minister must not be confounded with the negotiators of Dover. He was not without the feelings of an Englishman and a Protestant, nor did he, in his solicitude for his own interests, ever wholly forget the interests of his country and of his religion. He was desirous, indeed, to exalt the prerogative, but the means by which he proposed to exalt it were widely different from those which had been contemplated by Arlington and Clifford. The thought of establishing arbitrary power by calling in the aid of foreign arms, and by reducing the kingdom to the rank of a dependent principality, never entered into his mind. His plan was to rally round the monarchy, those classes which had been firm allies of the monarchy, during the troubles of the preceding generation, and which had been disgusted by the recent crimes and errors of the court. With the help of the old cavalier interest of the nobles, of the country gentlemen, of the clergy, and of the universities, it might, he conceived, be possible to make Charles not indeed an absolute sovereign, but a sovereign scarcely less powerful than Elizabeth had been. Prompted by these feelings, Danby formed the design of securing to the cavalier party the exclusive possession of all political power, both executive and legislative. In the year 1675, 
Accordingly, a bill was offered to the Lords, which provided that no person should hold any office, or should sit in either House of Parliament, without first declaring an oath that he considered resistance to the kingly power as, in all cases, criminal, and that he would never endeavour to alter the government, either in church or state. During several weeks, the debates, divisions, and protests caused by this proposition kept the country in a state of excitement. The opposition in the House of Lords, headed by two members of the cabal, who were desirous to make their peace with the nation, Buckingham and Shaftesbury, was beyond all precedent, vehement and pertinacious, and at length proved successful. The bill was not indeed rejected, but was retarded, mutilated, and at length suffered to drop. So arbitrary and so exclusive was Danby's scheme of domestic policy. His opinions touching foreign policy did him more honour. They were, in truth, directly opposed to those of the cabal, and differed little from those of the country party. He bitterly lamented the degraded situation to which England was reduced, and declared with more energy than politeness that his dearest wish was to cudgel the French to a proper respect for her. So little did he disguise his feelings, that, at a great banquet, where the most illustrious dignitaries of the state and of the church were assembled, he, not very decorously, filled his glass to the confusion of all who were against a war with France. He would, indeed, most gladly, have seen his country united with the powers which were there combined against Louis, and was for that end bent on placing Temple, the author of the Triple Alliance, at the head of the department which directed foreign affairs. But the power of the Prime Minister was limited. In his most confidential letters he complained that the infatuation of his master prevented England from taking her proper place among European nations. Charles was insatiably greedy of French gold. He had by no means relinquished the hope that he might, at some future day, be able to establish absolute monarchy by the help of the French arms, and for both reasons he wished to maintain a good understanding with the court of Versailles. Thus the sovereign leaned toward one system of foreign politics, and the minister toward a system diametrically opposite. Neither the sovereign nor the minister, indeed, was of a temper to pursue any object with undeviating constancy. Each occasionally yielded to the importunity of the other. Their jarring inclinations and mutual concessions gave to the whole administration a strangely capricious character. Charles, sometimes from levity and indolence, suffered Danby to take steps which Louis resented as mortal injuries. Danby, on the other hand, rather than relinquish his great place, sometimes stooped to compliances which caused him bitter pain and shame. The king was brought to consent to a marriage between the Lady Mary, eldest daughter and presumptive heiress of the Duke of York, and William of Orange, the deadly enemy of France, and the hereditary champion of the Reformation. Nay, the brave Earl of Ossory, son of Ormond, was sent to assist the Dutch with some British troops, who on the most bloody day of the whole war signally vindicated the national reputation for stubborn courage. The treasurer, on the other hand, was induced not only to connive at some scandalous pecuniary transactions which took place between his master and the court of Versailles, but to become, unwillingly indeed, and ungraciously, an agent in those transactions. Meanwhile, the country party was driven by two strong feelings in two opposite directions. The popular leaders were afraid of the greatness of Louis, who was not only making head against the whole strength of the Continental Alliance, but was even gaining ground. Yet they were afraid to entrust their own king with the means of curbing France, lest those means should be used to destroy the liberties of England. The conflict between these apprehensions, both of which were perfectly legitimate, made the policy of the opposition seem as eccentric and fickle as that of the court. The Commons called for a war with France, till the King, pressed by Danby to comply with their wish, seemed disposed to yield, and began to raise an army. But as soon as they saw that the recruiting had commenced, their dread of Louis gave place to a nearer dread. They began to fear that the new levies might be employed on a service in which Charles took more interest than in the defence of Flanders. They therefore refused supplies, and clamouring for disbanding as loudly as they had just before clamoured for arming. 
Those historians who have severely reprehended this inconsistency do not appear to have made sufficient allowance for the embarrassing situation of subjects, who have reason to believe that their prince is conspiring with a foreign and hostile power against their liberties. To refuse him military resources is to leave the state defenceless, yet to give him military resources may be only to arm him against the state. In such circumstances vacillation cannot be considered as a proof of dishonesty or even weakness. These jealousies were studiously fomented by the French king. He had long kept England passive by promising to support the throne against the Parliament. He now, alarmed at finding that the patriotic councils of Danby seemed likely to prevail in the closet, began to inflame the Parliament against the throne. Between Louis and the country party there was one thing, and one only in common, profound distrust of Charles. Could the country party have been certain that their sovereign meant only to make war on France, they would have been eager to support him. Could Louis have been certain that the new levies were intended only to make war on the constitution of England, he would have made no attempt to stop them, but the unsteadiness and faithlessness of Charles were such that the French government and the English opposition, agreeing in nothing else, agreed in disbelieving his protestations, and were equally desirous to keep him poor and without an army. Communications were opened between Barillon, the ambassador of Louis, and those English politicians who had always professed, and who indeed sincerely felt, the greatest dread and dislike of the French ascendancy. The most upright of the country party, William Lord Russell, son of the Earl of Bedford, did not scruple to concert with the foreign mission schemes for embarrassing his own sovereign. This was the whole extent of Russell's offence. His principles and his fortune alike raised him above all temptations of a sordid kind, but there is too much reason to believe that some of his associates were less scrupulous. It would be unjust to impute to them the extreme wickedness of taking bribes to injure their country. On the contrary, they meant to serve her. But it is impossible to deny that they were mean and indelicate enough to let a foreign prince pay them for serving her. Among those who cannot be acquitted of this degrading charge was one man who is popularly considered as the personification of public spirit, and who, in spite of some great moral intellectual faults, has a just claim to be called a hero, a philosopher, and a patriot. It is impossible to see, without pain, such a name in the list of the pensioners of France, yet it is some consolation to reflect that in our time a public man will be thought lost to all sense of duty and of shame, who should not spurn from him a temptation which conquered the virtue and pride of Algernon Sidney. The effect of these intrigues was that England, though she occasionally took a menacing attitude, remained inactive, till the Continental War, having lasted nearly seven years, was terminated by the Treaty of Nimeguen. The United Provinces, which in 1672 had seemed to be on the verge of utter ruin, obtained honourable and advantageous terms. This narrow escape was generally ascribed to the ability and courage of the young Stadtholder. His fame was great throughout Europe, and especially among the English, who regarded him as one of their own princes, and rejoiced to see him the husband of their future queen. France retained many important towns in the Low Countries, and the great province of Franche Comte. Almost the whole loss was borne by the decaying monarchy of Spain. A few months after the termination of hostilities on the continent came a great crisis in English politics. Towards such a crisis, things had been tending during eighteen years. The whole stock of popularity, great as it was, with which the king had commenced his administration, had long been expended. To loyal enthusiasm had succeeded profound disaffection. The public mind had now measured it back again the space over which it had passed between 1640 and 1660, and was once more in the state in which it had been when the long Parliament met. The prevailing discontent was compounded of many feelings. One of these was wounded national pride. That generation had seen England during a few years allied on equal terms with France, victorious over Holland and Spain, the mistress of the sea, the terror of Rome. 
the head of the Protestant interest. Her resources had not diminished, and it might have been expected that she would have been at least as highly considered in Europe under a legitimate king, strong in the affection and willing obedience of his subjects, as she had been under a usurper whose utmost vigilance and energy were required to keep down a mutinous people. Yet she had, in consequence of the imbecility and meanness of her rulers, sunk so low that any German or Italian principality which brought five thousand men into the field was a more important member of the Commonwealth of Nation. With the sense of national humiliation was mingled anxiety for civil liberty. Rumours, indistinct indeed, but perhaps the more alarming by reason of their indistinctness, imputed to the court a deliberate design against all the constitutional rights of Englishmen. It had even been whispered that this design was to be carried into effect by the intervention of foreign arms. The thought of such intervention made the blood, even of the cavaliers, boil in their veins. Some, who had always professed the doctrine of non-resistance in its full extent, were now heard to mutter that there was one limitation to that doctrine— for foreign force were brought over to coerce the nation, they would not answer for their own patience. But neither national pride nor anxiety for public liberty had so great an influence on the popular mind as hatred of the Roman Catholic religion. That hatred had become one of the ruling passions of the community, and was as strong in the ignorant and profane as in those who were Protestants from conviction. The cruelties of Mary's reign, cruelties which even in the most accurate and sober narrative excites just detestation, and which were neither accurately nor soberly related in the popular martyrologies. The conspiracies against Elizabeth, and above all the gunpowder plot, had left in the minds of the vulgar a deep and bitter feeling, which was kept up by annual commemorations, prayers, bonfires, and processions. It should be added that those classes which were peculiarly distinguished by attachment to the throne, the clergy and the landed gentry, had peculiar reasons for regarding the Church of Rome with aversion. The clergy trembled for their benefices, the landed gentry for their abbeys and great tithes. While the memory of the reign of the saints was still recent, hatred of popery had in some degree given place to hatred of Puritanism. But during the eighteen years which had elapsed since the Restoration, the hatred of Puritanism had abated, and the hatred of Popery had increased. The stipulations of the Treaty of Dover were accurately known to very few, but some hints had got abroad. The general impression was that a great blow was about to be aimed at the Protestant religion. The King was suspected by many of a leaning towards Rome. His brother and heir presumptive was known to be a bigoted Roman Catholic. The first Duchess of York had died a Roman Catholic. James had then, in defiance of the remonstrances of the House of Commons, taken to wife the Princess Mary of Medina, another Roman Catholic. If there should be sons by this marriage, there was reason to fear that they might be bred Roman Catholics, and that a long succession of princes hostile to the established faith might sit on the English throne. The Constitution had recently been violated for the purpose of protecting the Roman Catholics from the penal laws. The ally, by whom the policy of England had during many years been chiefly governed, was not only a Roman Catholic, but a persecutor of the Reformed Churches. Under such circumstances it is not strange that the common people should have been inclined to apprehend a return of the times of her whom they called Bloody Mary. Thus the nation was in such a temper that the smallest spark might raise a flame. At this juncture fire was set in two places at once, to the vast mass of combustible matter, and in a moment the whole was in a blaze. The French court, which knew Danby to be its mortal enemy, artfully contrived to ruin him, by making him pass for its friend. Louis, by the instrumentality of Ralph Montague, a faithless and shameless man, who had resided in France as minister from England, laid before the House of Commons proofs that the treasurer had been concerned in an application made by the court of Whitehall to the court of Versailles for a sum of money. This discovery produced its natural effect. The treasurer was, in truth, exposed to the vengeance of Parliament. 
not on account of his delinquencies, but on account of his merits. Not because he had been an accomplice in a criminal transaction, but because he had been a most unwilling and unserviceable accomplice, but of circumstances which have, in the judgment of posterity, greatly extenuated his fault. His contemporaries were ignorant. In their view he was the broker who had sold England to France. It seemed clear that his greatness was at an end, and doubtful whether his head could be saved. Yet was the ferment excited by this discovery slight, when compared with the commotion which arose when it was noised abroad that a great popish plot had been detected. One Titus Oates, a clergyman of the Church of England, had by his disorderly life and heterodox doctrine drawn on himself the censure of his spiritual superiors, had been compelled to quit his benefice, and had ever since led an infamous and vagrant life. He had once professed himself a Roman Catholic, and had passed some time on the continent in English colleges of the Order of Jesus. In those seminaries he had heard much wild talk about the best means of bringing England back to the true Church. From hints thus furnished, he constructed a hideous romance, resembling rather the dream of a sick man than any transaction which ever took place in the real world. The Pope, he said, had entrusted the government of England to the Jesuits. The Jesuits had by commission, under the seal of their society, appointed Roman Catholic, clergymen, noblemen, and gentlemen, to all the highest officers in church and state. The Papists had burned down London once. They had tried to burn it down again. They were at that same moment planning a scheme for setting fire to all the shipping in the Thames. They were to rise at a signal and massacre all their Protestant neighbours. A French army was at the same time to land in Ireland. All the leading statesmen and divines of England were to be murdered. Three or four schemes had been formed for assassinating the king. He was to be stabbed, he was to be poisoned in his medicine, he was to be shot with silver bullets. The public mind was so sore and excitable that these lies readily found credit with the vulgar, and two events which speedily took place led even some reflecting men to suspect that the tale, though evidently distorted and exaggerated, might have some foundation. Edward Coleman, a very busy and not very honest Roman Catholic intriguer, had been amongst the persons accused. Search was made for his papers. It was found that he had just destroyed the greater part of them, but a few which had escaped contained some passages, such as to minds strongly prepossessed, might seem to confirm the evidence of Oates. Those passages, indeed, when candidly construed, appear to express little more than the hopes which the posture of affairs, the predilections of Charles, the still stronger predilections of James, and the relations existing between the French and English courts, might naturally excite in the mind of a Roman Catholic strongly attached to the interests of his church. But the country was not then inclined to construe the letters of papists candidly, and it was urged, with some show of reason, that if the papers which had been passed over as unimportant were filled with matter so suspicious, some great mystery of iniquity must have been contained in those documents which had been carefully committed to the flames. A few days later it was known that Sir Edmundsbury Godfrey, an eminent justice of the peace who had taken the depositions of Oates against Coleman, had disappeared. Search was made, and Godfrey's corpse was found in a field near London. It was clear that he had died by violence. It was equally clear that he had not been set upon by robbers. His fate is to this day a secret. Some think that he perished by his own hand. Some that he was slain by a private enemy. The most improbable supposition is that he was murdered by the party hostile to the court, in order to give colour to the story of the plot. The most probable supposition seems, on the whole, to be that some hot-headed Roman Catholic, driven to frenzy by the lies of Oates, and by the insults of the multitude, and not nicely distinguishing between the perjured accuser and the innocent magistrate, had taken a revenge, of which the history of persecuted sects furnishes but too many examples. If this were so, the assassin must have afterwards bitterly execrated his own wickedness and folly. The capital and the whole nation went mad with hatred and fear. 
the penal laws, which had begun to lose something of their edge, were sharpened anew. Everywhere justices were busied in searching houses and seizing papers. All the jails were filled with papists. London had the aspect of a city in a state of siege. The train bands were under arms all night. Preparations were made for barricading the great thoroughfares. Patrols marched up and down the streets. Cannon were planting round Whitehall. No citizen thought himself safe unless he carried under his coat a small flail, loaded with lead, to brain the Popish assassins. The corpse of the murdered magistrate was exhibited during several days to the gaze of great multitudes, and was then committed to the grave, with strange and terrible ceremonies, which indicated rather fear and the thirst of vengeance shall sorrow or religious hope. The houses insisted that a guard should be placed in the vaults over which they sate, in order to secure them against the second gunpowder plot. All their proceedings were of a piece with this demand. Ever since the reign of Elizabeth, the oath of supremacy had been exacted from members of the House of Commons. Some Roman Catholics, however, had contrived so to interpret this oath that they could take it without scruple. A more stringent test was now added. Every member of Parliament was required to make the declaration against such transubstantiation, and thus the Roman Catholic lords were, for the first time, excluded from their seats. Strong resolutions were adopted against the Queen. Commons threw one of the secretaries of state into prison for having countersigned commissions directed to gentlemen who were not good Protestants. They impeached the Lord Treasurer of high treason. Nay, they so far forgot the doctrine which, while the memory of the civil war was still recent, they had loudly professed, that they even attempted to wrest the command of the militia out of the king's hands. To such a temper had eighteen years of misgovernment brought the most loyal Parliament that had ever met in England. Yet it may seem strange that even in that extremity the king should have ventured to appeal to the people. For if the people were more excited than their representatives, the lower house, discontented as it was, contained a large number of cavaliers, then were likely to find seats again. But it was thought that a dissolution would put a stop to the prosecution of the Lord Treasurer, a prosecution which might probably bring to light all the guilty mysteries of the French alliance, and might thus cause extreme personal annoyance and embarrassment to Charles. Accordingly, in January 1679, the Parliament, which had been in existence ever since the beginning of the year 1661, was dissolved, and writs were issued for a general election. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay Book One, Chapter Two, Part Eight. During some weeks, the contention over the whole country was fierce and obstinate beyond example. Unprecedented sums were expended, new tactics were employed. It was remarked by the pamphleteers of the time as something extraordinary that horses were hired at a great charge for the conveyance of electors. The practice of splitting freeholds for the purpose of multiplying votes dates from this memorable struggle. Dissenting preachers, who had long hidden themselves in quiet nooks from persecution, now emerged from their retreats, and rode from village to village for the purpose of rekindling the zeal of the scattered people of God. The tide ran strong against the government. Most of the new members came up to Westminster in a mood little differing from that of their predecessors, who had sent Strafford and Lord to the Tower. Meanwhile, the courts of justice— which ought to be in the midst of political commotions, sure places of refuge for the innocent of every party, were disgraced by wilder passions and fouler corruptions than were to be found even on the hustings. The tale of Oates, though it had sufficed to convulse the whole realm, would not, unless confirmed by other evidence, suffice to destroy the humblest of those whom he had accused. For by the old law of England two witnesses are necessary to establish a charge of treason. But the success of the first impostor produced its natural consequences. In a few weeks he had been raised from penury and obscurity to opulence, 
to power, which made him the dread of princes and nobles, and to notoriety, such as has for low and bad minds, all the attractions of glory. He was not long without coadjutors and rivals, a wretch named Carstairs, who had earned a livelihood in Scotland by going disguised to conventicles, then informing against the preachers, led the way. Bedloe, a noted swindler, followed, and soon, from all the brothels, gambling-houses, and sponging-houses of London, false witnesses poured forth to swear away the lives of Roman Catholics. One came with a story about an army of thirty thousand men, who were to muster in the disguise of pilgrims at Corona, and to sail thence to Wales. Another had been promised canonization and five hundred pounds to murder the king. A third had stepped into an eating-house in Covent Garden, and had there heard a great Roman Catholic banker vow, in the hearing of all the guests and drawers, to kill the heretical tyrant. Oates, that he might not be eclipsed by his imitators, soon added a large supplement to his original narrative. He had the portentous impudence to affirm, among other things, that he had once stood behind a door which was ajar, and had there overheard the Queen declare that she had resolved to give her consent to the assassination of her husband. The vulgar believed, and the highest magistrates pretended to believe, even such fictions as these. The chief judges of the realm were corrupt, cruel, and timid. The leaders of the country party encouraged the prevailing delusion. The most respectable among them, indeed, were themselves so far deluded as to believe the greater part of the evidence of the plot to be true. Such men as Shaftesbury and Buckingham doubtless perceived that the whole was a romance, but it was a romance which served their term, and to their seared consciousness the death of an innocent man gave no more uneasiness than the death of a partridge. The juries partook of the feelings then common throughout the nation, and were encouraged by the bench to indulge those feelings without restraint. The multitude applauded Oates and his confederates, hooted and pelted the witnesses who appeared on behalf of the accused, and shouted with joy when the verdict of guilty was pronounced. It was in vain that the sufferers appealed to the respectability of their past lives, for the public mind was possessed with a belief that the more conscientious a papist was, the more likely he must be to plot against a Protestant government. It was in vain that, just before the cart passed from under their feet, they resolutely affirmed their innocence, for the general opinion was that a good papist considered all lies which were servable to his church as not only excusable, but meritorious. While innocent blood was shedding under the forms of justice, the new Parliament met, and such was the violence of the predominant party, that even men whose youth had been passed amidst revolutions, men who remembered the attainder of Strafford, the attempt on the five members, the abolition of the House of Lords, the execution of the King, stood aghast at the aspect of public affairs. The impeachment of Danby was resumed. He pleaded the royal pardon, but the Commons treated the plea with contempt, and insisted that the trial should proceed. Danby, however, was not their chief object. They were convinced that the only effectual way of securing the liberties and religion of the nation was to exclude the Duke of York from the throne. The King was in great perplexity. He had insisted that his brother, the sight of whom inflamed the populace to madness, should retire for a time to Brussels. But this concession did not seem to have produced any favourable effect. The Roundhead Party was now decidedly preponderant. Toward that party leaned millions, who had, at the time of the Restoration, leaned toward the side of the prerogative of the old Cavaliers. Many participated in the prevailing fear of popery, and many, bitterly resenting the ingratitude of the Prince, for whom they had sacrificed so much, looked on his distress as carelessly as he had looked on theirs. Even the Anglican clergy, mortified and alarmed by the apostasy of the Duke of York, so far countenanced the opposition as to join cordially in the outcry against the Roman Catholics. The king in this extremity had recourse to Sir William Temple, of all the official men of that age. Temple had preserved the fairest character. The Triple Alliance had been his work. He had refused to take any part in the politics of the cabal, and had, while that administration directed affairs, lived in strict privacy. He had quitted his retreat at the call of Danby, 
had made peace between England and Holland, and had borne a chief part in bringing about the marriage of the Lady Mary to her cousin, the Prince of Orange. Thus he had the credit of every one of the few good things which had been done by the government since the Restoration. Of the numerous crimes and blunders of the last eighteen years, none could be imputed to him. His private life, though not austere, was decorous. His manners were popular, and he was not to be corrupted either by titles or by money. Something, however, was wanting to the character of this respectable statesman. The temperature of his patriotism was lukewarm. He prized his ease and his personal dignity too much, and shrank from responsibility with a pusillanimous fear. Nor, indeed, had his habits fitted him to bear a part in the conflict of our domestic factions. He had reached his fiftieth year without having sate in the English Parliament, and his official experience had been almost entirely acquired at foreign courts. He was justly esteemed one of the first diplomatists of Europe, but the talents and accomplishment of a diplomatist are widely different from those which qualify a politician to lead the House of Commons in agitated times. The scheme which he proposed showed considerable ingenuity. Though not a profound philosopher, he had thought more than most busy men of the world on the general principles of government, and his mind had been enlarged by historical studies and foreign travel. He seems to have discerned more clearly than most of his contemporaries one cause of the difficulties by which the government was beset. The character of the English polity was gradually changing. The Parliament was slowly but constantly gaining ground on the prerogative. The line between the legislative and executive powers was in theory as strongly marked as ever, but in practice was daily becoming fainter and fainter. The theory of the Constitution was that the King might name his own ministers, but the House of Commons had driven Clarendon, the Cabal, and Danby successfully from the direction of affairs. The theory of the Constitution was that the King alone had the power of making peace and war, but the House of Commons had forced him to make peace with Holland, and had all but forced him to make war with France. The theory of the Constitution was that the King was the sole judge of the cases in which it might be proper to pardon offenders. Yet he was so much in dread of the House of Commons that, at that moment, he could not venture to rescue from the gallows men whom he well knew to be innocent victims of perjury. Temple, it would seem, was desirous to secure to the legislature its undoubted constitutional powers, and yet to prevent it, if possible, from encroaching further on the province of the executive administration. With this view he determined to interpose between the Sovereign and the Parliament, a body which might break the shock of their collision. There was a body, ancient, highly honourable, and recognised by the law, which he thought might be so remodelled as to serve this purpose. He determined to give to the Privy Council a new character and office in the government. The number of councillors he fixed at thirty. Fifteen of them were to be the chief ministers of state, of law, and of religion. The other fifteen were to be unplaced noblemen, and gentlemen of ample fortune and high character. There was to be no interior cabinet. All the thirty were to be entrusted with every political secret, and summoned to every meeting, and the king was to declare that he would, on every occasion, be guided by their advice. Temple seems to have thought that, by this contrivance, he could at once secure the nation against the tyranny of the crown, and the crown against the encroachments of the parliament. It was, on one hand, highly improbable that schemes such as had been formed by the cabal would be even propounded for discussion in an assembly consisting of thirty eminent men, fifteen of whom were bound by no tie of interest to the court. On the other hand, it might be hoped that the commons, content with the guarantee against misgovernment which such a privy council furnished, would confine themselves, more than they had of late done, to their strictly legislative functions and would no longer think it necessary to pry into every part of the executive administration. This plan, though in some respects not unworthy of the abilities of its author, was in principle vicious. The new board was half a cabinet and half a parliament, 
and like almost every other contrivance, whether mechanical or political, which is meant to serve two purposes altogether different, failed of accomplishing either. It was too large and too divided to be a good administrative body. It was too closely connected with the crown to be a good checking body. It contained just enough of popular ingredients to make it a bad council of state, unfit for the keeping of secrets, for the conducting of delicate negotiations, and for the administration of war. Yet were these popular ingredients by no means sufficient to secure the nation against misgovernment. The plan, therefore, even if it had been fairly tried, could scarcely have succeeded. And yet it was not fairly tried. The king was fickle and perfidious, the parliament was excited and unreasonable, and the materials out of which the new council was made, though perhaps the best which at that age afforded, was still bad. The commencement of the new system was, however, hailed with general delight, for the people were in a temper to think any change an improvement. They were also pleased by some of the new nominations. Shaftesbury, now their favourite, was appointed Lord President. Russell, and some other distinguished members of the country party, were sworn of the council. But a few days later all was again in confusion. The inconveniences of having so numerous a cabinet were such that Temple himself consented to infringe one of the fundamental rules which he had laid down and to become one of a small knot which really directed everything. With him were joined three other ministers, Arthur Capel, Earl of Essex, George Savile, Viscount Halifax, and Robert Spencer, Earl of Sunderland. Of the Earl of Essex, then First Commissioner of the Treasury, it is sufficient to say that he is a man of solid, though not brilliant parts, and of grave and melancholy character that he had been connected with the country party, and that he was at this time honestly desirous to effect, on terms beneficial to the state, a reconciliation between that party and the throne. End of Part 8 This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, and to find out how you can volunteer, please visit LibriVox. Dot org. The History of England from the Accession of James the Second by Thomas Babington Macaulay. Book One, Chapter Two, Part Nine. Among the statesmen of those times, Halifax was ingenious the first. His intellect was fertile, subtle, and capacious. His polished, luminous, and animated eloquence, set off by the silver tones of his voice was the delight of the House of Lords. His conversation overflowed with thought, fancy, and wit. His political tracts well deserve to be studied, for their literary merit, and fully entitle him to a place among English classics. To the weight derived from talents so great and various, he united all the influence which belongs to rank and ample possessions. Yet he was less successful in politics, than many who enjoyed smaller advantages. Indeed, those intellectual peculiarities which make his writings valuable frequently impeded him in the contest of active life. For he always saw passing events, not in the point of view in which they commonly appear to one who bears a part in them, but in the point of view in which, after the lapse of many years, they appear to the philosophic historian. With such turn of mind, he could not long continue to act cordially with any body of men. All the prejudices, all the exaggerations of both the great parties in the state, moved his scorn. He despised the mean arts and unreasonable clamours of demagogues. He despised still more the doctrines of divine right and passive obedience. He sneered impartially at the bigotry of the churchman and at the bigotry of the Puritan, he was equally unable to comprehend how any man should object to saints' days and surplices, and how any man should persecute any other man for objecting to them. In temper he was what, in our time, is called a conservative. In theory he was a republican. Even when his dread of anarchy and his disdain for vulgar delusions led him to side for a time with the defenders of arbitrary power, his intellect was always with Locke and Milton. Indeed, 
his jests upon hereditary monarchy were times such as would have better become a member of the calf's head club than a privy councillor of the Stuarts. In religion he was so far from being a zealot that he was called by the uncharitable an atheist. But this imputation he vehemently repelled, and in truth, though he sometimes gave scandal by the way in which he exerted his rare powers, both of reasoning and of ridicule, on serious subjects, he seems to have been by no means unsusceptible of religious impressions. He was the chief of those politicians, whom the two great parties contemptuously called Trimmers. Instead of quarrelling with this nickname, he assumed it as a title of honour, and vindicated with great vivacity the dignity of the appellation. Everything good, he said, trims between extremes. The temperate zone trims between the climate in which men are roasted, and the climate in which they are frozen. The English church trims between the Anabaptist madness and the Papist lethargy. The English constitution trims between Turkish despotism and Polish anarchy. Virtue is nothing but a just temper between propensities, any one of which, if indulged to excess, becomes vice. Nay, the perfection of the supreme being himself consists in the exact equilibrium of attributes, none of which could preponderate without disturbing the whole moral and physical order of the world. Thus, Halifax was a trimmer on principle. He was also a trimmer by the constitution, both of his head and of his heart. His understanding was keen, sceptical, inexhaustibly fertile in distinctions and objections. His taste refined, his sense of the ludicrous exquisite, his temper placid and forgiving, but fastidious, and by no means prone either to malevolence or to enthusiastic admiration. Such a man could not long be constant to any band of political allies. He must not, however, be confounded with the vulgar crowd of renegades, for though, like them, he passed from side to side, his transition was always in the direction opposite to theirs. He had nothing in common with those who fly from extreme to extreme, and who regard the party which they have deserted, with all animosity far exceeding that of consistent enemies. His place was on the debatable ground between the hostile divisions of the community, and he never wandered far beyond the frontier of either. The party to which he at any moment belonged was the party which at that moment he liked least, because it was the party of which at that moment he had the nearest view. He was, therefore, always severe upon his violent associates, and always in friendly relations with his moderate opponents. Every faction in the day of its insolent and vindictive triumph incurred his censure, and every faction, when vanquished and persecuted, found in him a protector. To his lasting honour it must be mentioned that he attempted to save those victims whose fate has left the deepest stain both on the Whig and on the Tory name. He had greatly distinguished himself in opposition, and had thus drawn on himself the royal displeasure, which was indeed so strong that he was not admitted into the Council of Thirty, without much difficulty and long altercation. As soon, however, as he had obtained a footing at court, the charms of his manner and of his conversation made him a favourite. He was seriously alarmed by the violence of the public discontent. He thought that liberty was for the present safe, and that order and legitimate authority were in danger. He therefore, as was his fashion, joined himself to the weaker side. Perhaps his conversion was not wholly disinterested, for study and reflection, though they had emancipated him from many vulgar prejudices, had left him a slave to vulgar desires. Money he did not want and there is no evidence that he ever obtained it by any means which, in that age, even severe censors considered as dishonourable. But rank and power had strong attractions for him. He pretended, indeed, that he considered titles and great officers as baits which could allure none but fools, that he hated business, pomp, and pageantry, and that his dearest wish was to escape from the bustle and glitter of Whitehall, 
to the quiet woods which surrounded his ancient mansion in Nottinghamshire. But his conduct was not a little at variance with his professions. In truth, he wished to command the respect at once of courtiers and of philosophers, to be admired for attaining high dignitaries, and to be at the same time admired for despising them. Sunderland was Secretary of State. In this man, political immorality of his age was personified in the most lively manner. Nature had given him a keen understanding, a restless and mischievous temper, a cold heart, and an abject spirit. His mind had undergone a training by which all his vices had been nursed up to the rankest maturity. At his entrance into public life, he had passed several years in diplomatic posts abroad, and had been during some time minister in France. Every calling has its peculiar temptations. There is no injustice in saying that diplomatists, as a class, have always been distinguished by their address, by the art with which they win the confidence of those with whom they have to deal, by the ease with which they catch the tone of every society into which they are admitted, than by generous enthusiasm or austere rectitude, and the relations between Charles and Louis were such that no English nobleman could long reside in France as envoy, and retain any patriotic or honourable sentiment. Sunderland came forth from the bad school in which he had been brought up, cunning, supple, shameless, free from all prejudices, and destitute of all principles. He was, by hereditary connection, a cavalier, but with the cavaliers he had nothing in common. They were zealous for monarchy, and condemned in theory all resistance. Yet they had sturdy English hearts, which would never have endured real despotism. He, on the contrary, had a languid speculative liking for republican institutions, which was compatible with perfect readiness to be in practice the most servile instrument of arbitrary power. Like many other accomplished flatterers and negotiators, he was far more skilful in the art of reading the characters and practising on the weaknesses of individuals than in the art of discerning the feelings of great masses and of foreseeing the approach of great revolutions. He was adroit in intrigue, and it was difficult, even for shrewd and experienced men, who had been amply forewarned of his perfidy, to withstand the fascination of his manner, and to refuse credit to his professions of attachment. But he was so intent on observing and courting particular persons, that he often forgot to study the temper of the nation. He therefore miscalculated grossly with respect to some of the most momentous events of his time. More than one important movement and rebound of the public mind took him by surprise, and the world unable to understand how so clever a man could be so blind to what was clearly discerned by the politicians of the coffee-houses, sometimes attributed to deep design, what were, in truth, mere blunders. It was only in private conference that his eminent abilities displayed themselves. In the royal closet, or in a very small circle, he exercised great influence. But at the council board he was taciturn, and in the House of Lords he never opened his lips. The four confidential advisers of the Crown soon found that their position was embarrassing and invidious. The other members of the council murmured at a distinction inconsistent with the King's promises, and some of them, with Shaftesbury at their head, again betook themselves to strenuous opposition in Parliament. The agitation, which had been suspended by the late changes, speedily became more violent than ever. It was in vain that Charles offered to grant to the Commons any security for the Protestant religion which they could devise, provided only that they could not touch the order of succession. They would hear of no compromise. They would have the Exclusion Bill, and nothing but the Exclusion Bill. The King, therefore, a few weeks after he had publicly promised to take no step without the advice of his new council, went down to the House of Lords without mentioning his intention in council, and prorogued the Parliament. The day of the prorogation, the 26th of May, 1679, is a great era in our history, 
for on that day the habeas corpus act received the royal assent from the time of the great charter the substantive law respecting the personal liberty of englishmen had been nearly the same as at present but it had been inefficacious for want of a stringent system of procedure what was needed was not a new light but a prompt and searching remedy and such a remedy the habeas corpus act supplied the king would gladly have refused his consent to that measure but he was about to appeal from his parliament to his people on the question of the succession and he could not venture at so critical a moment to reject a bill which was in the highest degree popular on the same day the press of england became for a short time free in old times printers had been strictly controlled by the court of star chamber the long parliament had abolished the star chamber but had in spite of the philosophical and eloquent expostulation of milton established and maintained a censorship soon after the restoration an act had been passed which prohibited the printing of unlicensed books and it had been provided that this act should continue in force till the end of the first session of the next parliament that moment had now arrived and the king in the very act of dismissing the house emancipated the press shortly after the prorogation came a dissolution and another general election the zeal and strength of the opposition were at the height the cry for the exclusion bill was louder than ever and with this cry was mingled another cry which fired the blood of the multitude but which was heard with regret and alarm by all judicious friends of freedom not only the rights of the duke of york an avowed papist but those of his two daughters sincere and zealous protestants were assailed it was confidently affirmed that the eldest natural son of the king had been born in wedlock and was lawful heir to the crown charles while a wanderer on the continent had fallen in at the hague with lucy walters a welsh girl of great beauty but of weak understanding and dissolute manners she became his mistress and presented him with a son a suspicious lover might have had his doubts for the lady had several admirers and was not supposed to be cruel to any charles however readily took her word and pour forth on little james crofts as the boy was then called an overflowing fondness such as seemed hardly to belong to that cool and careless nature soon after the restoration the young favourite who had learned in france the exercises then considered necessary to a fine gentleman made his appearance at whitehall he was lodged in the palace attended by pages and permitted to enjoy several distinctions which had till then been confined to princes of the blood royal he was married while still in tender youth to anne scott heiress of the noble house of buccleuch he took her name and received with her hand possession of her ample domains the estate which he had acquired by this match was popularly estimated at not less than ten thousand pounds a year titles and favours more substantial than titles were lavished on him he was made duke of monmouth in england duke of buccleuch in scotland a knight of the garter master of the horse commander of the first troop of lifeguards chief justice of ayr south of trent and chancellor of the university of cambridge nor did he appear to the public unworthy of his high fortunes his countenance was eminently handsome and engaging his temper sweet his manners polite and affable though a libertine he won the hearts of the puritans though he was known to have been privy to the shameful attack on sir john coventry he easily obtained the forgiveness of the country party even austere moralists own that in such a court strict conjugal fidelity was scarcely to be expected from one who while a child had been married to another child even patriots were willing to excuse a headstrong boy for visiting with immoderate vengeance an insult offered to his father and soon the stain left by loose amours and midnight brawls was effaced by honourable exploits when charles and louis united their forces against holland monmouth commanded the english auxiliaries who were sent to the continent and approved himself a gallant soldier 
and a not unintelligent officer. On his return he found himself the most popular man in the kingdom. Nothing was withheld from him. The crown. Nor did even the crown seem to be absolutely beyond his reach. The distinction which had most injudiciously been made between him and the highest nobles had produced evil consequences. When a boy, he had been invited to put on his hat in the presence chamber, while Howards and Seymours stood uncovered around him. When foreign princes died, he had mourned for them in the long purple cloak, which no other subject, except the Duke of York and Prince Rupert, was permitted to wear. It was natural that these things should lead him to regard himself as a legitimate prince of the House of Stuart. Charles, even at a ripe age, was devoted to his pleasures, and regardless of his dignity. It could hardly be thought incredible that he should at twenty have secretly gone through the form of espousing a lady whose beauty had fascinated him. While Monmouth was still a child, and while the Duke of York still passed for a Protestant, it was rumoured throughout the country, and even in circles which ought to have been well informed, that the King had made Lucy Walters his wife, and that, if every one had his right, her son would be Prince of Wales. Much was said of a certain black box, which, according to the vulgar belief, contained the contract of marriage. When Monmouth had returned from the Low Countries with a high character for valour and conduct, and when the Duke of York was known to be a member of a church detested by the great majority of the nation, this idle story became important. For it there was not the slightest evidence. Against it there was the solemn asseveration of the King, made before his council, and by his order communicated to his people. But the multitude, always fond of romantic adventures, drank in eagerly the tale of the secret espousals and the black box. Some chiefs of the opposition acted on this occasion as they acted with respect to the more odious fables of Oates, and countenanced the story which they must have despised. The interest which the populace took in him, whom they regarded as the champion of the true religion, and the rightful heir of the British throne, was kept up by every artifice. When Monmouth arrived in London at midnight, the watchmen were ordered by the magistrates to proclaim the joyful event throughout the streets of the city. The people left their beds, bonfires were lighted, the windows were illuminated, the churches were opened, and a merry peal rose from all the steeples. When he travelled, he was everywhere received, with not less pomp, and with far more enthusiasm, than had been displayed when kings had made progresses through the realm. He was escorted from mansion to mansion by long cavalcades of armed gentlemen and yeomen. Cities poured forth their whole population to receive him. Electors thronged round him, to ensure him that their votes were at his disposal. To such a height were his pretensions carried, that he not only exhibited on his escutcheon the lions of England and the lilies of France without the baton sinister, under which, according to the law of heraldry, they should have been debruised in token of his illegitimate birth, but ventured to touch for the king's evil. At the same time he neglected no art of condescension by which the love of the multitude could be conciliated. He stood godfather to the children of the peasantry, mingled in every rustic sport, wrestled, played at quarterstaff, and won foot-races in his boots against fleet-runners in shoes. It is a curious circumstance that at two of the greatest conjunctures in our history the chiefs of the Protestant party should have committed the same error, and should by that error have greatly endangered their country and their religion. At the death of Edward the Sixth, they set up the Lady Jane, without any show of birthright, in opposition, not only to their enemy, Mary, but also to Elizabeth, the true hope of England, and of the Reformation. Thus the most respectable Protestants, with Elizabeth at their head, were forced to make common cause with the Papists. In the same manner, a hundred and thirty years later, a part of the opposition, by setting up Monmouth as a claimant of the crown, attacked the rights, not only of James, whom they justly regarded as an implacable foe of their faith and their liberties, but also of the Prince and Princess of Orange, who were eminently marked out, both by situation and by personal qualities, 
as the defenders of all free governments and of all reformed churches. The folly of this course speedily became manifest. At present the popularity of Monmouth constituted a great part of the strength of the opposition. The elections went against the court. The day fixed for the meeting of the Houses drew near, and it was necessary that the King should determine on some line of conduct. Those who advised him discerned the first faint signs of a change of public feeling, and hoped that by merely postponing the conflict he would be able to secure the victory. He therefore, without even asking the opinion of the Council of the Thirty, resolved to prorogue the new Parliament before he entered on business. At the same time, the Duke of York, who had returned from Brussels, was ordered to retire to Scotland, and was placed at the head of the administration of that kingdom. Temple's plan of government was now avowedly abandoned, and very soon forgotten. The Privy Council again became what it had been. Shaftesbury, and those who were connected with him in politics, resigned their seats. Temple himself, as was his wont in unquiet times, retired to his garden and his library. Essex quitted the Board of Treasury, and cast in his lot with the opposition. But Halifax, disgusted and alarmed by the violence of his old associates and Sunderland, who never quitted place while he could hold it, remained in the King's service. In consequence of the resignations which took place at this conjuncture, the way to greatness was left clear to a new set of aspirants. Two statesmen, who subsequently rose to the highest eminence which a British subject can reach, soon began to attract a large share of the public attention. These were Lawrence Hyde and Sidney Godolphin. Lawrence Hyde was the second son of the Chancellor Clarendon, and was brother of the first Duchess of York. He had excellent parts, which had been improved by parliamentary and diplomatic experience. But the infirmities of his temper detracted much from the effective strength of his abilities. Negotiator and courtier as he was, he never learned the art of governing or of concealing his emotions. When prosperous, he was insolent and boastful. When he sustained a check, his undisguised mortification doubled the triumph of his enemies. Very slight provocations sufficed to kindle his anger, and when he was angry, he said bitter things, which he forgot as soon as he was pacified, but which others remembered many years. His quickness and penetration would have made him a consummate man of business, but for his self-sufficiency and impatience. His writings proved that he had many of the qualities of an orator, but his irritability prevented him doing himself justice in debate, for nothing was easier than to goad him into a passion, and from the moment when he went into a passion he was at the mercy of opponents far inferior to him in capacity. Unlike most of the leading politicians of that generation, he was a consistent, dogged, and rancorous party man, cavalier of the old school, a zealous champion of the crown and of the church, and a hater of republicans and nonconformists. He had consequently a great body of personal adherents. The clergy especially looked on him as their own man, and extended to his foibles an indulgence of which, to say the truth, he stood in some need. For he drank deep, and when he was in a rage, and he very often was in a rage, he swore like a porter. He now succeeded Essex at the Treasury. It is to be observed that the place of First Lord of the Treasury had not then the importance and dignity which now belonged to it. When there was a Lord Treasurer, that great officer was generally Prime Minister, but when the White Staff was in commission, the Chief Commissioner hardly ranked so high as the Secretary of State. It was not till the time of Walpole that the First Lord of the Treasury became, under a humbler name, all that the Lord High Treasurer had been. Godolphin had been bred a page at Whitehall, and had early acquired all the flexibility and the self-possession of a veteran courtier. He was laborious, clear-headed, and profoundly versed in the details of finance. Every government, therefore, found him an useful servant, and there was nothing in his opinions or in his character which could prevent him from serving any government. Sidney Godolphin, said Charles, is never in the way, and never out of the way. 
this pointed remark goes far to explain Godolphin's extraordinary success in life. He acted at different times with both the great political parties, but he never shared in the passions of either. Like most men of cautious temper and prosperous fortunes, he had a strong disposition to support whatever existed. He disliked revolutions, and for the same reason for which he disliked revolutions, he disliked counter-revolutions. His deportment was remarkably grave and reserved, but his personal tastes were low and frivolous, and most of the time, which he could save from public business, was spent in racing, card-playing, and cock-fighting. He now sat below Rochester at the Broad of Treasury, and distinguished himself there by assiduity and intelligence. Before the new Parliament was suffered to meet for the dispatch of business, a whole year elapsed, an eventful year, which has left lasting traces in our manners and language. Never before had political controversy been carried on with so much freedom. Never before had political clubs existed with so elaborate an organization or so formidable an influence. The one question of the exclusion occupied the public mind. All the presses and pulpits of the realm took part in the conflict. On one side, it was maintained that the constitution and religion of the state could never be secure under a popish king. On the other, that the right of James to wear the crown, in his turn, was derived from God, and could not be annulled, even by the consent of all the branches of the legislature. Every county, every town, every family was in agitation. The civilities and hospitalities of neighbourhood were interrupted. The dearest ties of friendship and of blood were sundered. Even schoolboys were divided into angry parties, and the Duke of York and the Earl of Shaftesbury had zealous adherents on all the forms of Westminster and Eton. The theatres shook with the roar of the contending factions. Pope Joan was brought on to the stage by the zealous Protestants. Pensioned poets filled their prologues and epilogues with eulogies on the king and the duke. The malcontents besieged the throne with petitions, demanding that Parliament might be forthwith convened. The royalists sent up addresses, expressing the utmost abhorrence of all who presumed to dictate to the sovereign. The citizens of London assembled by tens of thousands to burn the Pope in effigy. The government posted cavalry at Temple Bar, and placed ordnance around Whitehall. In that year our tongue was enriched with two words, mob and sham, remarkable memorials of a season of tumult and imposture. Opponents of the court were called Birmingham's, petitioners and exclusionists. Those who took the king's side were anti-Birmingham's, abhorrers and tantivies. These appellations soon became obsolete, but at this time were first heard two nicknames, which, though originally given in insult, were soon assumed with pride, which are still in daily use, which have spread as widely as the English race, and which will last as long as the English literature. It is a curious circumstance that one of these nicknames was of Scotch, and the other of Irish origin. Both in Scotland and in Ireland, misgovernment had called into existence bands of desperate men, whose ferocity was heightened by religion's enthusiasm. In Scotland, some of the persecuted covenanters, driven mad by oppression, had lately murdered the primate, had taken arms against the government, had obtained some advantages against the king's forces, and had not been put down till Monmouth, at the head of some troops from England, had rooted them at Bothwell Bridge. These zealots were most numerous among the rustics of the western lowlands, who were vulgarly called Whigs. Thus the appellation of Whig was fastened on the Presbyterian zealots of Scotland, and was transferred to those English politicians who showed a disposition to oppose the court, and to treat Protestant nonconformists with indulgence. The Bogs of Ireland at the time afforded a refuge to popish outlaws, much resembling those who were after known as white boys. These men were then called Tories. The name of Tory was therefore given to Englishmen, who refused to concur in excluding a Roman Catholic prince from the throne. 
The rage of the hostile factions would have been sufficiently violent if it had been left to itself, but it was studiously exasperated by the common enemy of both. Louis still continued to bribe and flatter both the court and the opposition. He exhorted Charles to be firm. He exhorted James to raise a civil war in Scotland. He exhorted the Whigs not to flinch and to rely with confidence on the protection of France. Through all this agitation, a discerning eye might have perceived that the public opinion was gradually changing. The persecution of the Roman Catholics went on, but convictions were no longer matters of course. A new brood of false witness, among whom a villain named Dangerfield was the most conspicuous, infested the courts, but the stories of these men, though better constructed than that of Oates, found less credit. Juries were no longer so easy of belief as during the panic which had followed the murder of Godfrey, and judges, who, while the popular frenzy was at the height, had been its most obsequious instruments, now ventured to express some part of what they had from the first thought. At length, in October 1680, the Parliament met. The Whigs had so great a majority in the Commons that the Exclusion Bill went through all its stages there without difficulty. The King scarcely knew on what members of his own cabinet he could reckon. Hyde had been true to his Tory opinions, and had steadily supported the cause of hereditary monarchy. But Godolphin, anxious for quiet, and believing that quiet could be restored only by concession, wished the bill to pass. Sunderland, ever false, and ever short-sighted, unable to discern the signs of approaching reactions, and anxious to conciliate the party which he believed to be irresistible, determined to vote against the court. The Duchess of Portsmouth implored her royal lover not to rush headlong to destruction. If there were any point on which he had a scruple of conscience, or of honour, it was the question of the succession. But during some days it seemed that he would submit. He wavered, asked what sum the Commons would give him if he yielded, and suffered a negotiation to be opened with the leading Whigs. But a deep mutual distrust, which had been many years growing, and which had been carefully nursed by the arts of France, made a treaty impossible. Neither side would place confidence in the other. The whole nation now looked with breathless anxiety to the House of Lords. The assemblage of peers was large. The King himself was present. The debate was long, earnest, and occasionally furious. Some hands were laid on the pommels of swords, in a manner which revived the recollection of the stormy parliaments of Edward the Third and Richard the Second. Shaftesbury and Essex were joined by the treacherous Sunderland, but the genius of Halifax bore down all opposition. Deserted by his most important colleagues, and opposed to a crowd of able antagonists, he defended the cause of the Duke of York in a succession of speeches which many years later were remembered as masterpieces of reasoning, of wit, and of eloquence. It is seldom that oratory changes votes, yet the attestation of contemporaries leaves no doubt that on this occasion votes were changed by the oratory of Halifax. The bishops, true to their doctrines, supported the principle of hereditary right, and the bill was rejected by a great majority. The party which preponderated in the House of Commons, bitterly mortified by this defeat, found some consolation in shedding the blood of Roman Catholics. William Howard, by Count Stafford, one of the unhappy men who had been accused of a share in the plot, was impeached, and on the testimony of Oates, and of two other false witnesses, Dugdale and Turberville, was found guilty of high treason, and suffered death. But the circumstances of his trial and execution ought to have given an useful warning to the Whig leaders. A large and respectable minority of the House of Lords pronounced the prisoner not guilty. The multitude, which a few months before had received the dying declaration of Oates's victims with mockery and execrations, now loudly expressed a belief that Stafford was a murdered man. When he, with his last breath, protested his innocence, the cry was, "'God bless you, my lord! We believe you, my lord!' A judicious observer might easily have predicted that the blood then shed would shortly have blood.